I am Caitlin Stats. I am so happy that you guys have decided to come to our first roundtable Zoom discussion uh, about different ways that we can help learn and improve as part of the audio drama community. Thank you guys for coming. Let's go ahead and start this roundtable discussion on project funding, where to start. So the way that we're going to do this is we are going to have three presentations. If you have questions during the presentations, please put them in the chat. That way we can address the questions at the end of all three presentations in the order in which they were uh, brought up context-wise and in the order of which people had the questions. That way it's fair for everybody. Uh, in addition to that, after we do the Q&A, we're going to open up everything to discussion, which can get a little bit chaotic, so we're gonna try and see how we can mitigate that. This is Richard Brooks, and he will be giving a presentation on ROI and business models for audio drama production. So I will let him start whenever he shares his screen or anything he wants Brilliant. to do. Thank you very much. I'll just uh, see if I can get it to work now. I'm a, I'm a little nervous not having done this and I'm gonna select the wrong file and you're gonna see my shopping list or something. Okay, I think this works. I'll talk to about this for about 20 minutes or so. Um, for those that don't know me, I, in terms of my actual day job, I tend to work more in terms of the technology sector, looking at new research ideas, or innovations and seeing how they can be developed into sustainable businesses or not. Um, more of my personal passion is more around audio drama, whether it's for writing it or sort of studying it in this context and seeing how these models may or may not apply in the same context. So please, I'd love to hear your insights into this, any different views that you've got, any sort of ways that it can be shaped in this sector which is different from others. But this is some of my observations that I've been making so far. Uh, the, from the title here, you, you'll see the sort of subtitle, Pay the Rent or Pay the Mortgage. Um, one of the reasons why I put that in um, was mostly because it's a case that a lot of the discussions in audio drama seem to revolve around how you can make the project you've got now sustainable, or more in the case, it's how you can get a project income from it. But a lot of the questions really around return of investment must be around what kind of investment, what kind of return do you want? over the short term and the long term and so particularly if you're thinking about building this into a more sustainable business there's a need to sort of think about well is this something that could say take a loss now with the view of a future prospect which may be more beneficial but we are going to discuss that later on okay so broadly speaking you can categorize audio fiction into a range of different uh, levels here some of them will float between them but i've, I've got class them here sort of as a hobby as a prototype or a, a showcase, I'll discuss that in a bit more detail soon, um, as a funded production or as a sort of sustainable business. And some of these, there are some that sort of veer between names, but there's also some quite significant differences between them. And I would say in, in t between say a funded production, which a lot of, characterizes a lot of where we are in terms of audio drama, the vast bulk of them, and a sustainable business, there's, there's quite a big difference, and a lot of that comes down to capital. So I've got a question there around which audio dramas that have sort of sustained themselves over 10 years and grown, what's the characteristics of them that make them different? It's worth thinking about, and we'll bring them up. At each different level, there are different sets of questions. Now, some of these questions are just generically useful uh, to think about but they, they also relate to um, as you're progressing through. So the most important question is always, why are you doing this? And if you've not asked yourself properly, it is useful to kind of get a partner or a friend to kind of like probe you on that a little bit more into detail, just to really understand what is the return that you think that you're getting out of this? What are your objectives? Who is your audience? What are their interests? Um, what makes your product distinctive? And what is the income stream? And what actually are you selling? Because it may not actually be the podcast itself. It might be the community that you're building up. It might be advertising revenue for the people who are listening. It, so it's, it, you need to think what makes it distinctive. Also, as you're building it into some more sustainable business, there's a question about how do you reuse IP? Because if you're constantly living in the present, you're always going to be at a much higher level of risk. You need to be able to build a long tail of IP that can be reused over time. How do you lock in a customer loyalty in an, an ever more crowded space? Um, and there are businesses that do this, but there's not many of them. Um, and obviously, how do you diversify? Oh, by the way, please stop me if I'm blathering on too quickly or anything like that. Um, 
also, I've just got a, a little chart here. It's not exhaustive by any means, but it's just a useful way of thinking, what is the return that you want? And it, you know, of course, this may not be actually financial. A lot of people will go into audio drama just because they've got a story in their head and it's a great medium for getting it out there, working with people, having fun, and, uh, and achieving something that you possibly couldn't do it either in terms of prose or in terms of film, in terms of this level of financing. Um, but you may also find, as you get more into audio drama, that you're moving through some of these levels and thinking, well, I like what I'm doing, I wanna make it a bit more sustainable, or I've got something which I'm putting an awful lot of time and work into, but how do I now make it into something which I can, you know, make a living out of sustainably? So very briefly, I hear I just kind of like noted down a few things of what you might want a different use. This will of course be completely different for everyone. It's not sequential, it's not lineal. People may want to just stop just purely at for fun and that's fine. Um, but that we'll just sort of discuss then what different businesses models relate to that. So first of all, just to briefly discussing audio drama as a hobby. I really think this is an underrated form here because audio drama as a hobby, it's, it's something that I think started off as a much more common thing um, up until sort of 2014, where it's sort of the, the sort of commercialization of it took off a little bit more. But I don't think the models have really been explored because it is the great advantages of it is it's comparatively very low cost. It's low work. And if you're thinking about the level of fun to work ratio, which is an important thing to consider for a sustainable thing. Having it as a hobby is something which is really helpful. It allows you to build up the connections and the, the, the learning and the social capital is really important. Um, and you don't also have to get into the kind of costing problems. As soon as you're building in an income, you have to then start thinking about how you're paying. And you might find you're in a sort of situation in which you're paying out more than you're bringing in. Um, a really good example of this for me was a Scottish podcast. I mean, some of you might have been familiar with the fact that they got halfway into a crowdfunding bid for season two. Great, great show. And then halfway through, they decided to do an announcement to say that they're going to pull the bid because they basically just decided that the whole process of going through funding campaigns, both it added an extra dimension of work but also it took away a dimension of fun. And that fun really affected the writing process. Um, and I think one of the things that makes it distinctive is the fact that it's got that freewheeling freedom to do what it wants. So know your fun work ratio, essentially. The second thing though, is it doesn't necessarily have to be a producer-led project. We tend to think about it mostly in these ways in which there's a producer or a, a sound designer or a writer has their vision and they bring in remote actors or something like that to help with them. They're, they're, you know, they're really keen to help. But it can also be a bit more of a kind of cooperative theater type thing in which people all make a contribution to so that they're able to guide the creative process that maybe that they can be a sort of series or productions and this can operate perhaps a bit more as a collective or a bit more as a network style model um, but it doesn't have to be all on the producer obviously that gives them more control but releasing a bit of control can take away some of the stress and obviously if you're a writer sound designer voice actors the opportunity to be working between different productions um, particularly say, I mean, I think this is very common for voice actors, but maybe more so for like a writer, you get to learn the different styles, you get to build up those networks, which can be very helpful. Anyway, um, so moving on, audio drama as a prototype. I think this one probably does need a bit more explaining because I think we're probably more familiar with the first and sort of third options here. But it strikes me that, again, working in the business that I do, where I tend to work more in sort of new inventions, new technologies, most people wouldn't be investing an awful lot of their time, money, effort into a long six series arc, unless they've got a, a model that they can sort of sell to people. It might be selling to their audience, it might be selling to funders, that they can, um, that really sort of showcases what they want to do. So there's, there's different models here. It might be to sort of say that a production is viable. It might be selling it to a different media. 
it might be there intended to show off the skills of the team. Um, and some of the examples here you'll be familiar with, for example, um, Homecoming, and obviously there's been a number of different productions that have sort of started off and then moved very quickly into another media. I also think that the first season of Wooden Overcoats, and it might be interesting to hear Liz's view on this, had similar kind of characteristics. It's a very expensive production for um, what it's trying to achieve, but it wonderfully showcases the skills of almost everybody involved. It's that there's a large crew, a large cast, that a lot of work has gone into the first season of Wooden Overcoats, but it does really showcase it well. Also Blood Cultural. The real quality of these though, is that they do, you, there is a high level of cost a lot of the time with these because they have to be high quality. It's part of building a portfolio that you're able to then take potentially to a funder along the line or to an employer along the line and say, I'm able to produce at this level. Um, so, and obviously that comes with some hazards as well in terms of the high costs and the, the high likelihood of making a loss. Um, so prototypes can provide a foothold into the industry. It can be something that can be used as something that's tradable later on to just sort of say what you can achieve. Um, but I would also say that the best prototypes are usually ones that are paid for by somebody else, <laughs> wherever possible. Uh, if, you're, if it's able to sort of sell an idea to somebody else, um, then that's going to give you an enormous advantages in them being able to then market it. And blood culture in that sense is a really, really good example. Um, for those that aren't familiar with it, um, I think Lance Dan was one of the people who produced it. Um, it was funded by the Wellcome Trust. It's a, a large a charitable trust in the UK, and it was intended to show off, uh, or not show off, to, to develop in a popular consciousness some of the sort of scientific con um, concepts that the show explored. However, it, was, it enabled with very large budget, um, the opportunity to really explore what could be done in terms of sound design. And uh, you may be aware that it won quite a lot of awards. And from that perspective, uh, I know Lance Dan is involved in quite a lot of different productions at the moment. I'm tr actually been trying to get hold of him and his diary is absolutely packed off the back of Blood Culture. Um, so there's a right range of different styles as well. Some are very much, say, proof of concept for showing off to a media scene. So things like um, Bronzeville, Sight Unseen, Homecoming, they're all things that you can see in potentially being scaled up into another media. There's a showcase one, which I've discussed, grant funded or commissioned ones, uh, open calls, of course. There are um, organizations that do have open calls for producing these and, and obviously probably the most obvious one if you're in the UK is the BBC. Um, and sorry, I'll just, before I go on to that, but as I say, a lot of these do tend to be um, with a focus on relative one-off production, relatively uh, high cost, uh, and it, it tends to be a relatively complete story. So that you're able to demonstrate that you're able to tell a story that's got a full narrative arc within a relatively confined period. So, so, yeah, moving on to um, the Bright Sessions here. I've got this quote here from John Dryden, who is, I know, is a big fan of the work that um, was done in the Bright Sessions, principally because I think he highlighted the fact that it was a really sustainable format as a show. And here I'm wanting to discuss this idea of funding, um, funding an ongoing series. The great thing, as I say, about home, uh, Bright Sessions is, is it really thought about its audience, thought that the majority of its audience are used to a sort of podcast chat style in which you've got essentially like a group of friends that you're used to, and it's not a big leap to going over into audio drama. Also, from a kind of costing perspective, it was a, it was much more slimmed down production in terms of acting and in terms of, oh, sorry, not in terms of acting, in terms of casting, and in terms of sound design. Um, so you're able to keep the momentum going. The only area where there's a real lot of pressure, I'd imagine, is around this sort of scripting of it. Um, but there, I think that's, and a range of other models here that I sort of highlight here. Um, I mean, it, some of the, one of the reasons I think why the D&D &D is so popular at the moment, and we can, we can argue whether or not that is audio drama in a sort of full sense, 
but again, it's one. It's a format which is very sustainable. It's you. You can see uh, at a certain point that you're going to reach a break-even point relatively quickly with some of these. So you can, and one of the important aspects of funded productions is that it takes time to build up enough awareness that you have enough income going through, whether it's crowdfunding, whether it's from ad revenue. Um, and usually that break even point may be around two or three series is in. I know with in the case of Wolf 359, I think it was a really only in series three that you said that big sweeping increase in terms of the audience, which enabled them to make this a sort of more fully funded production. Up until that point, it wasn't as sustainable. Um, so some of the requirements, um, smaller casts, uh, more economical use of sound design. Um, I mean, it can be very full design when you need it, but that it's not um, a case that you're adding in footsteps all the time. Um, probably an in-house writing team uh, does need to be good quality material, certainly, but you also have to really understand your customers in this, in terms of what makes it interesting. And it's it's not always the case that your customers and your product is the audio drama itself. As I was sort of mentioning earlier, if like sort of steal the stars, you're thinking that the really the sort of product here is the is the listeners themselves. It's the getting the ad agencies to connect with those listeners. Then the, in that situation, you probably want something which has got some kind of star power behind it, whether that's in terms of the writer or in terms of the casting. In other situations, you might be wanting to develop a community. And I think, again, in Bright Sessions, that was a really good example where they, a lot of work was put in in the, in the social media side so that it built up a community within the sort of format of Patreon. Um, so people felt that they wanted to contribute it, not just because there was interesting things at different levels, but that they felt they were part of a greater whole. And I think that is something that podcasts are really good at leveraging that kind of sense that there is there's some kind of immediacy and there's some kind of connections between people listening um, but as i say there's difference here and of course you may also be appealing trying to appeal to commissioners um, the hazards with this though is that um, this is probably the most popular format it's a very very crowded market so you particularly if you're, for example, if you're in a horror format or if you're in science fiction, you really need to work hard in terms of thinking, well, what's going to make your series distinctive? Because it's not enough to make income. You've got to be able to be in a situation where you can be breaking even and hopefully making a profit so you can start reinvesting in other projects. Um, so, and of course, the other downside of this is that once you lose that visibility, the show's income often goes. So if you've got a really great um, show and it's been going on for a number of series, is you've decided to wrap up the show and start something new, a lot of the time then there'll be a big fall in terms of the income and you feel that you're, you're having to build it up back from base again. So it's, there's upsides and downsides to this model. And, I, and I've just discussed, and I'm sure these will be discussed in much greater detail later on, some of the options here. Um, Obviously, you'll be familiar with things like um, ongoing uh, crowdfunding, like uh, Patreon and donations. Uh, Kickstarter, I think, is a really, really good option if you're a number of series is into it. Um, I think to begin with, it is a very, very risky option because it has to be something where there is a very high level of visibility. Um, but once, if you feel confident enough that you're, you are able to achieve your funding goals, in that situation, it provides a much firmer base for budgeting and thinking what you can achieve. Advertising is obviously good, but advertising usually is a, a, a question of being able to connect people up. So if you're able to connect up large sort of well-known networks, production houses, well-known names, something that gives advertisers some kind of assurance that this is a sure thing then there's more uh, likely. Um, subscriptions, very difficult. That tends to be a model which is better for, for sort of uh, businesses with a much larger base of long tail IP, um, as is retail. Um, but live audiences productions, if you're particularly from a very densely populated area, can be uh, quite helpful because it's not just the case that they can help raise money. I'm not sure that they actually work terribly effectively for raising money as a live audience production. 
but I do think they're very uh, helpful in terms of increasing the loyalty and creating that sense of community. And again, I think that's something that, say, for example, um, Wooden Overcoats, um, Our Fair City, Wolf 359 have all done really, really effectively in their areas. Um, and again, I'd say for the funding options, funding can vary very much, uh, but it tends to be a case that these, the costs where these things are kept sustainable are kept relatively low. Uh, and then usually within the first season, there's a, some level of in-kind contribution um, before it becomes much more self-sustaining. And the last point I'd say is, obviously in this situation, probably the easiest option is to get somebody to pay for it. But in that situation, you tend to need some kind of prototype to be able to take it to them. Um, so the last option, and probably the most trickiest, is in terms of developing more of a sort of sustainable business. Um, interesting, thinking about the number of these organizations that are can have, have sort of developed over ten, the last sort of 10 years. Um, they tend to be organizations, broadly speaking, that are, have access to other IP or other platforms. Um, Big Finish is by far probably, as an independent goes, probably one of the best examples um, because they get so much of their marketing from their connection to the BBC, from their connection to the, uh, the wider Doctor Who and other um, sort of titles that they sort of um, um, produce. The, the, sort of the fan producers, the, the magazines, the associations that they're linked to gives them an enormous amount of uh, cross-platform marketing. Um, definitely human, I'm, I'm sort of, I have put in there, though I would also, uh, only on the basis that although this is not, uh, they're not a sort of large-scale uh, production house and they haven't been going for a large number of years, well, they do have some advantages. They have quite a, re a diverse range of podcasts. So there's things like Mars Corp, which is very, very labor intensive in terms of production. And then there's the stuff as, such as the International Biscuit Review or um, uh, Infinite, the Infinite Bad, which are much lower levels of um, costing in terms of production. So they're able to offset their risks a bit more and have um, some things that are able to pay for others. Um, Obviously, those who are in the most advantageous position, so those who are able to develop platforms where you have, say, subscriptions to IP which, um, or sort of content, and you've begun, developed a large enough catalogue of content. Uh, so that is something, as I say, wireless does effectively, um, Big Finish does effectively, and of course, Audible, obviously, that is their, the main part of their business model. Uh, it's not the only way to lock in uh, customer loyalty. And I know, again, in sort of big finish and audible, what you see is there is a, in terms of the fun work ratio, there's a lot more on the work side, that there is somebody continuously trying to find new offers each couple of weeks to keep people interested, keep people coming back to their site. So as I say, in terms of requirements, there's going to be a diverse range of different income streams. That's very, very important. Some things which are risky, high profile, exciting, some things that just bring in the money each week. And of course, in the case of Big Finish, that's Doctor Who. Um, reuse of IP is very important. Um, high production standards, because it is very difficult to be able to uh, sell things such as on a retail basis. Retail is great in terms of selling downloads, because it allows you to really operate at a scale and to be assured of the kind of money that you want to bring in. But at the same time, people will only buy if they think it is something that is quantitatively different from what they can get free on iTunes. It's a high risk uh, model. And I would say in all of these situations, they almost always operate with a large level of existing capital and existing reserves. There has to be a cash flow here because a number of people are usually employed. Um, so as I say, yes, um, Big Finish has been running for 20 years, but they've been doing so with, I put down here sort of 50,000, but they've got a good deal more than that, uh, which enables them to kind of ride through the periods when people aren't buying their things and that they're able to have in development stuff that's operating over a sort of two, three, four year basis and take advantage of the anniversaries or the, the sort of media launches elsewhere that they can get their sort of joint uh, marketing. 
Um, again, there's a range of different models here that you can see in terms of how uh, risk is uh, mitigated and income streams are diversified. Um, what I've tried to show here is that, as you can see, one of the reasons why Big Finish is so effective is that it is using quite a lot of these different models. Um, so it's got very good links with media, it's got a made a kind, it's got uh, a long tail model of um, retail. Long tail, of course, basically means the ability to sort of sell a small number, but a large amount of things over a long period. Um, as I say, subscription, um, something that ZDS does as well as wireless, um, and being able to sort of go between different cost models. Um, most important thing, as I've mentioned, is to have a lot of reserves. There has to be some kind of financial backing for this. So just to sum up, I say um, all creative businesses are risky. Um, when, and this is one of the things, when I'm talking to clients, again, in my day job, we classify different models, as, as different groups of things as having different levels of risks. Automotive is risky because it's um, high, um, very hierarchical production trains, medical is risky, and creative is very risky. It's risky because you're reinventing yourself very regularly, and you don't want to have to keep doing that too often because you, don't, you want to be able to keep a continuous group of uh, customers. It's easy to get into, but it quickly gets expensive. And it gets expensive in terms of opportunity costs because you could be doing other things if this is not something that's giving you, uh, making your life fun and exciting. So you've got to be sure that you want to be bearing the costs. You've got to know why you're in it. You've got to have a sense of your fun risk ratio. Um, it's amateur theatre is a good place to start. And I think a lot of the time it's one of those things that is uh, potentially a bit too looked down upon as something which can be really beneficial before people feel that they want to be confident moving up. Uh, if you're going to professionalise, do so because you've got an appetite for risk and you feel you, you can do something which is sustainable. Um, but thinking uh, long term, podcasting is really only one option. There is employment within various parts of the audio drama production industry. There is linking into providing sound for animation. Uh, there is audio books. And then the more you're able to diversify, the, the lower the risk is for yourself. Um, and I said, overall, creativity is about honing a distinctive voice. Um, but a creative business about is being able to adapt it to the customer needs. Uh, that's all for me. Um, I don't. I presume we're taking uh, questions later on. Is that right, Caitlin? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And now we are going to move on to Elizabeth Campbell. Please introduce yourself. I will. Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Elizabeth Campbell. Um, I don't have a fancy PowerPoint, so thanks, Richard, for making me look super coordinated. Um, so I'm afraid it's just my my face um, and my dulcet tones. Um, I am the uh, production manager for Wooden Overcoats. Uh, I'm also the business manager for Victoriosity. Uh, I've been asked to speak specifically on crowdfunding. Uh, now both Wooden Overcoats and Victoriosity have used crowdfunding. Um, I'm actually grateful uh, to Richard for bringing up the different um, types of, of audio drama productions. I think he's right to classify season one of Wooden Overcoats um, and Victoriosity, to be fair, as um, prototype productions. Uh, they were, there was no crowdfunding for, for those series. Uh, they were done on a very limited budget um, and were very much a, a proof of concept. But for the second and third seasons of Wooden Overcoats, um, we did use crowdfunding uh, as we did for the sec excuse me, second season of Victoriosity, which will be out soon. Um, all of those were Kickstarter campaigns uh, and uh, there are other models available, which I'll get into. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm a big um, advocate of crowdfunding as being part of a sustainable model or I think what Richard called a funded production. Um, the companies that I work with, basically we, we make these uh, particular podcasts. It's not that we have a, a, a range of different work, but what we have tried to do is to move from a season one prototype model into a funded version for uh, the future seasons, essentially so that we could grow and expand and really 
pay all the people who were involved in our productions. Um, there was money in the first seasons, but uh, it was really the move to the second season where we were trying to, um, yes, turn, turn it into a funded model where, where everyone who, who uh, collaborated with us could be able to be paid. Um, now, uh, I should also just be clear that um, crowdfunding was not the only source of income uh, for any of those productions. And I'm, I'm also an advocate of having as many multiple streams of income as you, you can have uh, for a funded production. But crowdfunding has been a significant, uh, a significant amount of money towards the budget uh, and I think is, is very much worth considering. Um, so I think, I mean, the first, first question really, why crowdfunding? Is that, is that where we're at? <laughs> um, okay, right. Sorry. Um, yeah, if there's any problems, just like wave dramatically at your, at your screen and I'll uh, shut up. Uh, sorry, that's probably my internet. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I've lost my place. Um, crowdfunding, really what it means is, is having a lot of people give you a little bit of money and that adds up to being a bigger bit of money that you can then use towards funding a project. That's, a, that's the really simple terms. Um, I would suggest there are different kind of psychologies behind crowdfunding campaigns. Um, one, the one that I, I would like to focus on is using crowdfunding as, as a business model. Uh, what I mean by this is crowdfunding obviously can be used as essentially a form of charity. So donations, so people who might give you money because they support your idea or they support you and family and friends um, and you want to see you make wonderful things. Uh, I think what um, Richard brought up about uh, a Scottish podcast is actually really interesting and I hadn't, I hadn't known that was the case, but talking about kind of more hobby audio dramas and the idea that, you know, having having money and having this kind of business plan isn't necessarily for you. That is, that is absolutely fine. And I think that if you are operating on that model, a kind of more, more donation based as in a charity based crowdfunding might, might work for you. Um, you do a thing, you do it for fun. If anybody wants to throw a couple of quid your way, great, but it's not the basis for your business model. Um, what I do want to talk about is though, treating it more as a business model, treating it as a sustainable and repeatable source of income. The thing about the donation model is that goodwill is often limited. So you might see in those kind of uh, charity campaigns, yeah, again, friends and family who might throw you some money, but won't necessarily do it long-term. What you really want is that money to be coming from your listeners, coming from the people who actually consume your show. Uh, again, Richard touched on this. One of the one of the best things about podcasting uh, and new media in general is that we have a really direct relationship uh, between the producers and the consumers. So really, us who make the stuff and the people who listen. There's no third party. There's no necessarily production company or advertisers or, or other body to answer to. It, it's it's a direct relationship between us and our listeners. We put it out there and they listen. And in that, I would argue that having, having a crowdfunding model can be, in many ways, the almost kind of the, the purest form of, of turning that in, into a transaction. You are, you are making something and the people who listen to it are paying for it. It is, it is a transaction. You are giving people something. And I think I always divert at this point because sometimes people can get funny about, you know, money and art and Feel weird about it but what we're talking about here is funding a project treating it as a business and you know there's nothing wrong you you pay for media you pay for entertainment everywhere and there's nothing wrong in asking people or um wanting people to give you money for the art that they are consuming so that's that's what i mean when i talk about crowdfunding is is using that direct relationship with the listener to get them to pay for your show, really. Um, so yeah, the, the next question I go to is, is crowdfunding right for you? 
uh, the, these are the fun bullet points in my notes. Um, so it's really a question of, of is crowdfunding right for your, for your production? And if so, when, when to crowdfund? Because I do think they, that depending on the stage of your production and even the stage you are in your release can have a, a very big effect on uh, the success of any crowdfunding campaign. Uh, now, really broadly, there's there's kind of three groups. There's pre-production, so you haven't started your show yet, but you need some money to get it off the ground. There's ongoing, so while you're releasing uh, or in anticipation of something future, but you've already released stuff before, or kind of retroactive crowdfunding to try and recoup costs that might have been expended in making a show. Uh, again, I think <laughs> I think what Richard said was 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 absolutely on point here. In that, it, in my opinion, the best time to crowdfund is when you already have something out there, because crowdfunding as a business model really does depend on that relationship you already have with your listeners. You want to already have listeners. You already want to have a relationship with those listeners. And that tends to happen once you've already got something out there. Um, as, as I said, both Wooden Overcoats and Victoriosity uh, waited until season two to do crowdfunding. And, and that was very much the reason why, because season one went out, there was a listener base, uh, and then it was, you know, it, that was the point where we were prepared to turn around and say, great, you like that show? Would you like more of this thing that you like? give us money and we'll give you more. Again, it's the, it's the transactional nature of it. And I think that that is really important to keep in mind. Um, now, obviously that's, that's great if you can, you know, for example, put out a season and wait till later to crowdfund. Uh, that's not the case for everyone. Uh, as Richard's saying, audio drama is, is not, is not the most expensive medium, but it, it does, it does cost something. Uh, and there is legitimate question to ask about uh, how to get money for for a starting production. Um, now, I think it it's possible, but it's trickier. Uh, again, if you've already got an existing show or even an existing uh, relationship, so maybe you had a show previously, you're funding a new show, you you automatically have an audience to draw uh, into for your crowdfunding. If you're an unknown entity, then it's difficult. I think, you know, the chances of you being stumbled upon on Kickstarter or just via the internet are, are, are very low. Um, one of my weird personal hobbies is combing Kickstarter pages and um, looking at successful and unsuccessful campaigns because, you know, you got to have a hobby. Um, and one of the things that I think you do see is uh, shows that you know, they're, they're not bad ideas. They, they make a little campaign, they put it up and they just seem to just put it out into the void and hope that somebody will, will stumble upon it. And I think the short version is that they, they don't realistically. Um, it's not impossible. I think if you have a, a particularly novel or unique idea, or if you've got some association with an, a worthy cause or something like that, then it is possible to attract strangers, essentially, if you do it through social media, do it through Kickstarter, but I wouldn't gamble on it, is, is, is my personal view. I think it's, it's tricky. If you are starting out, your best strategy is to try and put out some kind of proof of concept. So if you can't afford to make a whole first season before you crowdfund, try and make an episode. If you can't make a whole episode, try and make a trailer. Really, the more content you can put out before you ask for money, the better position you're in. Because you are beginning to create that relationship, you're beginning to show people what the show is. And you say, oh, well, you like this, you want more, give me money. There's also a certain part about um, developing trust. So if you, if you just say, I wanna make an audio drama, that, that could mean anything. We, we have no sense of your you know, your skills or your editing ability or anything like that. But if you can create an episode that sounds good and sounds competent, it's a lot easier to, to trust that person 
with money uh, and you're a lot more likely to get people being willing to invest and, and, and maybe take a gamble on a, on a newer entity if you can demonstrate that that this that your skills are there that you're you're going to be making something good because ultimately again it's a transaction it's not charity there these people are giving you money because they're going to get an audio drama in return so you want to give them a sense of what they're buying really um in terms of crowdfunding after the fact i have seen it done um i think most shows tend to go towards a more patreon model for that where it's as it's being released you can support it through patreon and that's recouping costs but i have seen it done on kickstarter on indiegogo um it's it's perfectly feasible again i think the trouble not the trouble with that. I think you are better suited when you are able to offer people something new. So a new season or a new episode or a, a mini series or something like that. Um, and the reason is, again, I think it's the transactional nature. What you're saying is you're, you're, you're buying this new thing, essentially. Uh, if you are asking people to retroactively pay for a thing that they've already got, it certainly can happen, but I think it depends a lot more. It's a different psychology. It's depending a lot more on people's goodwill of going back and compensating you for something that they've already consumed, um, as opposed to this idea of of investing in something that they're going to get in the future. Uh, so I think it's it's if you are thinking of if a uh, crowdfunding campaign is right for you, it is worth thinking about the timing and about whether you have this listenership this relationship with people to tap into um that will support you in this endeavor um as i as i said before but i just uh bring it back briefly um ideally i would say that crowdfunding is not your only source of income uh but i caveat that by saying that you want to make sure that you're not asking um you not you don't have hands out in too many directions basically uh crowdfunding can work very nicely with other things like you know if you have merch on your store i don't think anyone's going to criticize you for having a campaign to fund your new season also you can buy a t-shirt but um i have seen campaigns that have for example a patreon and a kickstarter at the same time and in that way i think it's also useful to think about what you're asking people to support because if you've got a patreon saying come and support this the show and a kickstarter that's simultaneously asking kind of the same thing i think people can feel either put upon or just confused about um how to give money or that they're already giving money it might be different if your patreon is more um you know uh kind of a subscription club for extras and then you have a kickstarter for a new season it really depends on how you structure your campaigns, but I'm just putting that out there as something that I think is worth thinking about um, so that you don't potentially overload or ask too much of that relationship between you and your listener. Um, right, so now that you've decided that a crowdfunding campaign is for you, uh, I've the next section would be uh, which crowdfunding platform will be good? Uh, there are, I'd say, there's three broad models, um, one being Patreon, which I will not talk about because Caitlin will be talking about and I do not want to step on her toes. Uh, so the ones I'll be talking about are the ones that are um, the, the campaigns, the limited time campaigns for a certain amount. In that you've got two broad categories, um, the kind of Kickstarter model and the Indiegogo model. Other crowd uh, funding platforms are available, but I think those break down easily the kind of differences kickstarter of course being the all or nothing approach so you set a goal if you hit the goal then you get your money if you don't hit the goal you don't get any money um indiegogo conversely you set a goal but regardless of whether you hit it or not you will get the amount of money pledged now as as i mentioned all the campaigns that i have worked on we have chosen to go via Kickstarter. Um, and that has been a conscious decision uh, for multiple reasons. I think Kickstarter is actually a very good platform. People know it very well. Um, but the all or nothing 
aspect of it uh, was actually what we were going for. Because when we sat down, we decided as, as a production group that we weren't willing to ask people back for free for a second season, to be perfectly honest. Um, we knew that it was make or break for us. Either we got enough to fund a second season and pay people the amount that we thought was was decent or or we wouldn't do it. Um, so that was that was one of the big factors on why we went to Kickstarter. Um, there is a sense, um, I've heard this, I, I can't personally confirm if it's true, but the sense that the all or nothing approach of Kickstarter is can be a, a push towards success because people know that you are, if you don't hit the goal, you're gonna fail and get nothing. Um, that can drive people to donate. Um, I definitely know that on the statistics, there are more Kickstarter campaigns that are successfully funded than Indiegogo. Now, does that mean that your campaign necessarily will be funded just because it's on Kickstarter? No, but uh, it's worth comparing the two and having a, a real think about which one suits your needs. Another thing about the difference is I, I think there is, we all have that kind of cautionary approach that I think takes the Indiegogo model, um, or looks at the Indiegogo model as, as a safer bet because you think, oh, at least I'll get some money. Um, but I would caution on that because sometimes some money is worse than no money. Um, the first and most obvious thing is you don't want to be committed to something that you can't afford. Uh, if you set a campaign that has a $4,000 goal, and you make $400 uh, on Kickstarter, it collapses and we all go away and, and that's kind of the end of that. Uh, if it's on Indiegogo, you have now taken $400 from, from people and ostensibly promised to make a new series of your show uh, and you've only got $400 to do it. And that, uh, that can be very difficult. And you need to have a serious think, especially when setting your budgets about how much you you realistically would need to put this on if it's possible that you'll find the funding elsewhere or that you're willing to subsidize it yourself that might be fine but if you can't cover the other 3600 pounds out of pocket um and that's what you need to make the show then in many ways it's better that you don't have the awkward money and are committed to something that's gonna financially be a strain um the other option is that you get <laughs> It's something that I like to call awkward money. I think Caitlin's heard me argue about this before. Uh, but it's where you make less than you expected, but more than more more than you would to cover costs. So you end up with a, a, a bit of an awkward situation where you have people working on your show, um, people who you might not be able to compensate to the level that they should be compensated. Um, but you don't have no money and it can lead to awkward situations awkward discussions where you need to decide well is it worth me paying everyone five pounds for their time or is it better to just keep it it, it it can be strange and i think it's just it's something to think about if you do choose for example an indiegogo campaign you know what happens if you don't hit your goal and what happens to this money uh I would also recommend transparency with all of your collaborators because the last thing you want is people sitting there thinking, oh, they've made so many thousands on Indiegogo, why aren't I seeing any? That's just a tangent for cautionary tales. Um, yeah, so um, those are your models. I think, again, we, we always went with Kickstarter. Um, Kickstarter takes about between five and 10% of fees, uh, which is something to be aware of. Um, I think it will, I'll lead into the next section, which is how, how to run a campaign. Um, the first thing you need to do is set a budget. I, I cannot stress enough how you really need to know exactly how much money you need. It goes back to this, what if you don't make enough money or what if you make awkward money? You should always have uh, a kind of, a high, low, and medium level budget. The low being the bare minimum you need to make make the show. Medium being a comfortable level and high, you know, something nice that you'd you'd be able to 
compensate people a bit better or whatever it might be. Um, but I can't stress enough, be diligent, cover, think about all of your costs. That includes hosting, that includes, you know, on a postage and packaging for things that you're going to send out, whatever it might be. Um, there's a lot of hidden costs. If you are making a show, I can't recommend strongly enough to write down every penny you spend because there's a lot of things you might forget about. Um, and yeah, and this is, you should really have a sense if you're trying to make a sustainable project, your, you know, the lowest number you can, you can take without being financially ruined by committing to a project. Uh, and yes, remember, remember the fees, remember the Kickstarter fees. I've seen a lot of projects that have forgotten and suddenly 10% of their money is gone and suddenly they haven't quite hit their budget. So just, just a, just a hint there. Um, okay. So you've got your, your budget that will help you set your, your goal on Kickstarter. Uh, the amount that will be make or break. Uh, your second step will really be to start thinking about rewards. Rewards are the, both the most fun and the most difficult part of any uh, Kickstarter campaign um, or Indiegogo campaign. Um, basically, you're trying to lure people into hitting a certain funding target. Uh, my tips in general on that uh, is, first of all, I think people, people tend to want more of the thing they like. So if they're there to support your show, it's probably because they want more of your show um so th just thinking about things you can give them that is a bonus as directly tied to the thing that they like the better you know sometimes you see um rewards that are well here's you know maybe another series i made or here's a a chat with one of the actors or something that might be the case depending on how your show is branded and how close you know the actors are tied but for the most part people are going to be attracted to rewards that are directly sourced to their area of interest being the show. Um, be very careful about um, the time and money that goes into fulfilling rewards. Uh, ideally, don't have physical rewards if you can avoid it, because if you're asked, if it's, you know, a $15 pledge and you're telling them they're going to get a, a t-shirt and a pencil case and it's going to cost you 12 bucks to send that out you're not really making money um and that yeah that goes for the money and again the time the time to fill fulfill rewards can be huge um so really be careful put any expenses in the budget make sure that's there fulfilling rewards is part of it um set realistic delivery times for your rewards that is also cautionary tale. Uh, it, so don't promise people things in a month when you can't get them to that. Um, and uh, another top tip I would give is try and attract people to a level that is slightly above what you think they're willing to give. So if you think that your listener generally be, would be willing to part with 10 pounds, $10 for your campaign, try and make your juiciest reward at $15, because that might just be enough to get that $10 person to go, ah, yeah, you know what, an extra five bucks, I'll, I'll, I'll chuck it in, get my special episode, or whatever it might be. Um, once you've planned the budget and the rewards, uh, it's uh, time to, you know, there's a campaign page on anything that you'll do. This takes a lot of time. Uh, it takes a lot more time than you think it does, probably. Uh, this includes I, I seriously recommend having a video. Uh, I think if you look at campaigns, really a video is, it's attractive, it's nice to see people's faces, and it's also a really good um, thing to share on social media. It's an easy way to have it on Facebook or something like that and attract attention. Uh, again though, videos can cost money. Make sure it's in the budget. Uh, this includes also art or anything you might need for a social media campaign. Plan it all out. Um, Look at other campaigns to see what you like or don't like. Uh, and top tip in your write up in your project description, be transparent. Again, because the the money you're getting is so dependent on the relationship you have with your listeners, you don't want to mislead them. You don't want to 
hide it away. It's, it's best to explain to them exactly where the money is going, exactly what's going to be used for. Uh, you just don't want to be in a situation where there's nasty surprises. Um, plan your campaign and <laughs> execute it. I, I mean, a full social media blitz. Um, this also this takes a lot of time i think a lot of people think they put up a campaign and you know a month later they come back and there's money if it's a month long you are going to be working for the entire month i promise you uh it, this is not again this isn't charity this is part of the business and you need to maintain it as a business um yeah try and give people things to keep them interested uh one of the theories i've, I've heard a lot that i think is very good is is give and take so if you are asking people to give you money, try and give them something as well. So don't just be continuously saying, give us money, give us money. Give them news updates, arts, give little competitions, whatever it might be. Uh, our shows, we've done mini episodes, which are great because you're giving, giving a mini episode, again, the thing that they like, more of the show, while also asking them to support. It's, it's, it's easier to get people's attention when you are giving them something and not just asking something from them. Uh, update. You can give updates on on Kickstarter on Indiegogo. Update on the funding process. Update after you have funded, so people know how the series is going. Uh, update on the delivery of rewards. It just you know these people have supported you because they want to be involved. Um, don't harass them, but give them some updates. Um, and I think I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to very quickly, uh, just a couple of, of random tips for campaigns. Um, just, yeah, uh, when you do a crowdfunding campaign, you're going to receive a lot of emails from people who are trying to get you to, I don't know, cross donate. You give me a pound, I'll give you a pound or say that they can do marketing for you. Just ignore them. Just ignore all of them. They're all scams. They're just don't, just don't do that. Um, and yeah, the last thing I want to say is just stretch goals. Uh, you don't have to have a stretch goal. Uh, I think stretch goal should probably be the difference between that kind of low or medium budget to a high budget. If you do have a stretch goal that you're giving something for, make sure that the money that you will need to spend in making the stretch goal is included in the stretch goal amount. Otherwise, you will just be screwing yourself. Um, stretch goals don't need to have them at the beginning. What you don't, you don't want to look overconfident. So if you're asking a lot from the beginning, uh, you don't necessarily want to have five stretch goals out there thinking that you're going to smash your way through the targets, but have them prepared, have them in your back pockets so that if you are doing well, you can deploy them. Uh, it can be okay not to hit stretch goals. In many ways, they are a way to continue driving um, crowdfunding after you've hit your goal. And even if you don't necessarily hit the stretch goal, you've got a little bit of extra money to work with, which is never a bad thing. Uh, so I think that is probably my time, Caitlin. Yes? Okay, I will. If you feel like you said what you want to say, then. I, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's my broad um, overview. Again, I'm very happy for, for questions. Um, and uh, yeah, crowdfunding is useful. In conclusion. <laughs> so I hope you're doing okay everyone. It's been an hour so far and I hope you've already learned a lot and now we're going to talk a little bit about Patreon. This is a brief introduction to project funding with Patreon. Uh, later in the year I'm going to be trying to get somebody from Patreon to actually give us a presentation to the audio drama community. So this is going to be a pretty general over overall and then uh, we'll finally get to Q&A and discussion afterwards. So let's jump right into it. Okay, so uh, what is Patreon and how does it work? Uh, this is also a type of crowdfunding. Again, what they've already said between Richard and Liz is that this is one of the best ways to directly interact with your audience. Patreon is a membership platform where fans support creators directly. They find your page, they know who you are, they love your show, they decide this is worth me giving. Uh, money but also time to to continue listening to continue reading to enjoy your updates and to build that relationship 
Um, it uses tiers of membership, similarly to the way that you do reward tiers on Kickstarter, except there is a few more hazards here that don't exist with Kickstarter, while Kickstarter has its own version of the same kind of hazards. Um, patrons get to choose the amount to which they want to support, also very similar. Um, the modern internet age of crowdfunding has a lot of similarities, even though there are seven different models. Different rewards and creator pages can be set for per creation or per month billing. That's going to be based on what it is that you as a creator feel is worth your time or what is easiest for you to fulfill. Again, this is a recurring membership. So instead of with Kickstarter or Indiegogo, where somebody gives you money once and then they wait for their rewards or lack thereof, this is a recurring donation or a recurring membership where they are constantly expecting something new for as long as they are a member. All right. So when does Patreon work? Um, I was very interested in some of the things that I was listening to Richard and Liz say. So I think that the way if I was going to break it down into what Richard was saying so we can tie this all together is that it works well with hobby prototype models and funded project models. If it's going to be used with a sustainable, sustainable business model, it does have to be one of several avenues of project funding that you have available to you. One of the things that I really liked about what Richard said that I want to bring up here because it ties really well into this is that this for Patreon, it has to do with when your show lives in the now and the income disappears when the story ends. So if you're set to per monthly or per creation billing on Patreon, you are only getting paid for as long as you are making something, which means you cannot stack up funding for your next creation in the months or years to come. So Patreon works best for returning seasons or new shows by known trusted creators because you have to have that level of intimacy with your audience already when there is a pre-existing audience to pull from. Patreon is not an audience building platform. You do not go to Patreon to build an audience to become your patrons. You go to Patreon to build a platform for your pre-existing audience to interact with. When utilizing tactics for audience conversion, so that means that you need to be able to pull your audience from whatever they're already listening to or part of and convert them into patrons. You need to actively be trying to do that. You cannot passively assume that someone understands that you have a Patreon and that they're going to go to it. You need to be putting it out in front of them without badgering them. <laughs> so um, patrons are fueled by relationships. So they want to see your face. They want to know what you're doing. They want to feel like they're helping an individual or a team that they have a personal relationship with. They're fueled by rewards, so they want to get access to things, they want to have more than other people, they want to know what they're getting, and they like exclusivity. So they feel like by being a patron or a member, they're part of a special club where they get things that other people do not get. But just like with Kickstarter, that means that there is a large investment of time to make those exclusive rewards or activities that you're going to be giving to these patrons. All right. So struggles and fallbacks. Uh, I already touched on this a little bit before. One of the ones I don't have here is that it is recurring. Uh, different from Indiegogo or Kickstarter is someone put in a credit card and every single creation, so every episode you release or every month, they're getting another charge and they're gonna see that charge. So every time they realize that's happening, they have to make a mental decision to stay on as a patron. They have to realize, oh, that wasn't just $15 one time, that's $5 every month. And is it still worth it? So as I noted earlier, it is not an audience building platform. You must import your own audience or convert your audience from listeners to membership patrons. The amount of time, like we had said already, the amount of time or money or talent needed to feed the rewards and exclusive content feed must remain active because people need to feel like their monthly rewards are worth the money they're putting in. Um, I have a, uh, a graphic later on for the struggles of balancing tiers for inclusivity versus payout. Uh, you'll see later on. I've, the struggles and paybacks are, or fallbacks are also include the fee. As with Kickstarter, there is usually around a 10% fee. They'll say that their fee is 5%, but you're not only losing a 5% fee to Patreon itself, you're losing uh, money to processing fees, you're losing money to VAT if some of the people are in different countries, 
you're losing money on lots of different tiny little things that are going to get pulled out every single time you're supposed to get your Patreon payment. Um, calculation of cost per reward. So this isn't just rewarding your members, this is rewarding yourself and your team. If you decide that one of your personal goals or rewards is going to be that you're going to hire on a new sound mixer and you're going to pay them $50 or 50 pounds, that means that from that point forward, you're now deducting that from your total and you have to adjust for that. The community building re uh, requires an outsourcing to another platform with Patreon because Patreon does not really create a sense of community on the platform itself. They recently connected uh, to Discord so that they can funnel Patreon groups over to Discord servers. You can also have things like Facebook groups or Twitter groups or things like that that allow you to interact with your patrons. But the interactivity on Patreon itself is very difficult and it doesn't allow you to easily build the community that actually strengthens your Patreon. Sorry, I'm going through mine very quickly to try and get to the Q&A <laughs> and uh, move on to discussions. So project funding and support. This is what we're all here for, right guys? <laughs> so access to funds on a monthly or per creation basis. We already touched on this, but if you start creating something and you're giving that content to your audience, it starts very small and it grows up from there. But even if you're getting that $2 per month at the very beginning, you get access to it on that first month. You don't have to wait several, several months or for as long as a Kickstarter campaign or you get it as soon as you create your first show. So if you create your show every week and you get a per creation basis, that means that you're gonna start getting paid as soon as possible. But it doesn't mean you're gonna start getting a lot very soon. You can get a dollar or $2 because Patreon starts incredibly small. It's very unlikely to have new creators move on to Patreon and see an instant boost in their take home funding. So it starts low, access to funds start quickly. Um, you can set public goals for future projects and promises, and these can help entice new members and member pledges. Uh, so let's say you set a goal for, you just started $50. If you get there, you're gonna release a, a very small monologue. And it's just you, so you, the, you know that you can create it, no problems. That small goal of $50 entices new people to join because they wanna hear that content, but it also entices old members to up their pledge to to faster receive that goal. So there are little tricks here and there that you can try and work with. And if you haven't joined the Patreon community and you're already using a Patreon, there are a ton of these videos put out by Patreon already on how to actually create and properly run a Patreon page. Uh, so you don't need me to tell you that, you can let the professionals do it. But a difficult balance of reward creation costs with profits for future project funding. So this is one of the things that I've created a little split for later and you'll see it. But as you continue to create and you offer greater goals, your increased cost of creation reduces the amount that you have for future project funding. Because like we stated earlier, without the large chunk of money up front, every time you get a smaller piece of money from Patreon, you're automatically putting more of that into a present production and not saving it for a future production. Increased workload to sustain promises. People want to see that their monthly bill is worth the money. <laughs> the best, it's best paired with additional avenues of funding as well. So we already discussed this, but uh, if I can use what we do on Patreon as an example, we have shows that run advertisements, but we don't put advertisements on our Patreon exclusive versions of those shows. We have merchandising. And people don't seem to mind that that's in addition to our Patreon because some people are interested in additional content while some people are interested in merchandise. But you cannot assume that all of your money is gonna come from one place when in reality, there are many ways that you can go ahead and try to create funding or profit for yourself that you can move into another project down the line. Um, and Pat Patreon is a constant platform for improvement. So by creating goals for yourself, to publicly showcase what it is that you're trying to do allows you to always believe on, okay, what am I gonna be working on? But it can fall to the same pitfalls as stretch goals on Kickstarter. If you promise too much, you might end up digging yourself deeper into a hole. All right, yes, there's my tier and, and goal balance uh, Patreon page event chart. So uh, this, this whole thing will be recorded and uploaded later for people to come and look at again, because I'm gonna go over this pretty quickly. But this is a good estimate of 
why it is that this can be kind of difficult. And I would like to point out before I say anything else that this does not account for any costs that are already in place that you've been paying out of pocket before you started your Patreon. So let's assume that you're already paying $97 out of your pocket for every episode. This does not include that. So you're actually already starting in the negative, which is not on this chart. So let's assume that you always account for a 10% uh, a fee, so times everything by 0.9. And now along the bottom, you'll see things like you begin your Patreon. Your first uh, mention gets you a little bit more uh, of a Patreon pledge. You feel pretty happy about it. You have your first goal, which you've decided kind of naively is going to be a physical good. And it is a postcard, which means that every month you're spending about $5 to send out postcards, which means that from that point forward, that is a permanent negative five to every single time you take home a Patreon uh, payment. You get 20 patrons and you do a digital party. That doesn't cost you anything. It only costs you time. You get to take home still the majority of that profit and you get to move that into the next project funding. You announce a new goal and suddenly you're gonna see it start to take off. You launch, a, you launch a new special offer, which is something that Patreon actually recently enacted. Those are very popular. That pushes you even further. Problem is, once you've done that special offer, you have to actually create and send out those rewards, which means that you have a big dip in costs for the payout of that special offer fulfillment. But you recover in the next month when you reach 75 patrons and you do another digital party, which again, costs you time, but doesn't cost you money. So it doesn't put too big of a dent in the take home funding. The next time is you feel happy, you've reached a goal. The goal is to get a new actor and pay them $50 monthly for being a small part in your show. But that means that every month that's another negative 50 that is part of your Patreon take home. So you can kind of see the next one is another goal where you've reached something that's even higher, but now you're promising even more of, oh, you're going to hire a mixed master guy. That's another negative 50 every single month. So now you're already losing $105 every single month is taken out of the Patreon because you know that you're going to be paying it to specific people. You're losing the amount of money that is the, the fees, the processing, and the VATs. And then here at the very end, you'll see something that happens particularly commonly on Patreon, which is your season ends. And when your season ends and you're not putting out content, many of your people leave. And once they leave, it is incredibly difficult to get them back on your boat. It's incredibly difficult to entice them back to your show. And you're losing out on all that possible funding that you'll need to bring them back for the next season. Okay, guys, everyone knows what a marketing funnel is. This is my own little version of the marketing funnel for Patreon. So your fans are going to be the people who go to Patreon, but it's not going to be all of your fans. Your fans are only part of the people who enjoy your genre, which is only part of the people who enjoy audio drama podcasts in general, which is only a small percentage of the people who enjoy any podcasts at all. So you need to be thinking of how do you get one person to go from podcasts to audio drama, to your genre, to your show, and then once you get them to enjoy your show, that conversion to your Patreon. So when everybody's talking about a rising tide lifting all boats, this means that the more people we have in audio drama in general, the more people we have in your genre in general, is going to help build who you are, what you do, and how you're able to sustain it. So the biggest draw for Patreon seems to be from all of the, the videos that I've watched and everything else is you. As a creator, you are the biggest draw for your Patreon. And I'm not just talking about the content you actually create. So you have to establish a trust, not only in who you are, but in the quality that you're providing to the people and the content. Someone needs to know, especially if you're setting up a new Patreon for a new show, just like with a Kickstarter, are they worth it for me to put money into it? You want to build a personal bridge to these people, to these fans and to these members. Members choose to support, to support creators that they care about personally. So have you reached out to them recently to do live events? Have you spoken with them in person at, uh, by live events previously, I meant live Twitter feeds, YouTube feeds, Facebook feeds, but there's also things like conventions or live shows where you personally get to see someone shake their hand and say, thank you so much for coming. That personal face-to-face -face or that computer screen to computer screen helps to build 
the trust and personal bridge you need to convert people from being a fan of your genre, your show, and then eventually a member, a member on your Patreon. And another thing people love about Patreon, even though they're not a community platform, is the community itself. Once they're there, how are you keeping them? You have to create a community with caring, active uh, people who not only support your content, but they support the other people who support your content. So they're interested to have conversations. We have a Facebook group that's very active that is filled with people from our Patreon because Patreon is not an active community center. And by doing that, we're allowing people to interact and they feel like they get a lot more out of being an exclusive member. Like I said, I went through this pretty quickly. Um, we are hoping to have an actual discussion with somebody from Patreon about how the audio drama community can better utilize the platform. So if you're looking for something a little bit more complex, this was just my generally where to start overview. Let me go ahead and stop sharing. And Travis will unmute people. I'm unmuting you all. Sorry if everyone time. can hear my dog. <laughs> Should you want to be unmuted. Uh, some of you don't have your mics enabled. But we're now at a Hello, Ezo. <laughs> yeah, sorry. He, I think he got something stuck under the... Uh, That's the fine. Bed. I'm here now. Hello. Hello. Okay. I remembered my audio interface is also plugged into the same hub <laughs> as my camera and it can't drive both. So um, I'm going to go back to the time at the beginning and we are going to start with the questions that we have for first for Richard and we're going to try to go through these pretty quickly so we can open them up into discussions afterwards. So Richard, this is from Ken Kennedy. Um, he says that his project is definitely sounding like a prototype. Um, he funded the projects exclusively out of pocket and it's been difficult to showcase the work to people as the project is currently a paid for audio drama. Is it a requirement for his project to be completely free? And if not, how does he showcase this to people who have the power to help make more? Um, I suppose the thing is, who are you targeting? Is, is the primary thing here. It certainly doesn't have to be free. The only advantage of it being free is you manage to get a much wider audience. They're not necessarily a paying audience though. Um, so if you're, you, you might be wanting to develop something which is purely there as a portfolio that you can take along to other organizations, it might be something that um, you might be with to release an audio book through Audible, but you need a marketing campaign for it. You, the main thing is to think about who are who is it that you're targeting this for. Um, and as I say, wherever possible, you can you can certainly pay for it out of your own pocket, and sometimes that is certainly necessary. But wherever it's possible to get somebody else to pay into it, you know, to work with their marketing, that's a especially advantageous, obviously. Okay. All right, so Travis has advised me I should let people read their own questions. I apologize. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, the next one is from Travis. Travis. <laughs> of course, because you just wanted to read your own question. I, I didn't want to, no, but I, I was curious, um, how does Star Power influence and boost um, listenership effectively? Um, I've worked with a few named actors and musicians in the past, and it, it's not really the full battle to get them on your show, I found. How does one effectively leverage a name? from your perspective, Richard? I think it's a question very much of um, bringing a number of different partners together. Um, interestingly, when we were talking about sort of Kickstarter earlier, I can think of one Kickstarter campaign which went from absolutely nothing um, to becoming quite big in terms of, uh, I think it was another one of the sort of War of the Worlds type thing because it had big name actors in it and it was therefore able to immediately grab people's attention. But then the problem is, unless you've got the sort of production team behind it, and you know you can, constant, you can confidently deliver on it, then you actually run into quite a lot of challenges when it comes to actually producing it. Um, having a big name in terms of an actor is helpful, but then it's, it's usually helpful in then linking across to advertisers and saying, we're much more assured that we can actually... Um, uh, you know, get a high number of listeners earlier on, and therefore, would you mind kind of providing some advertising support or linking it into publicists in terms of the case of 
if you're talking to newspaper people, magazines, uh, other media, um, you're able to leverage the, the, the big name much earlier on uh, to expand your listenership. Um, there's, there's a number of areas. I mean, the, probably the best example of this is something like Bronzeville, um, which really went to town, so particularly also just the, just the purely the connections of the big name themselves. If they, if they go to marketing your product, um, then you start from a, an immediately better position. But again, you need to know what you're using them for and preferably to be able to link that with other functions, other marketing functions. Thank you. Sure. I can unmute myself, sorry. So Travis, you also had another one before that that said, what can big name marketing do that we as independent creators cannot? Um, what are they doing better or smarter than, than us and is there a way to replicate it? And that was also an, a question for Richard. I think, so if I can also add related to that, it's, it's useful to look at what particularly Big Finish does because they are incredible in this regard. Um, they obviously tend to work with existing IP wherever possible, but that's not exclusively what they do. They do have their own originals range. But the, the great advantage is that they have magazines, associations, um, big name actors are all w willing to do the marketing on their behalf. And they're able to link in to certain anniversaries, birthday of the actor, um, you know, a, um, an anniversary of the event, a launch of the other television show, and use that as a way to boost up uh, the amount of people buying their things through sales or something like that. So they're in, an, they're in a relatively unique position, but it's still, it is very worth keeping an eye on how they do marketing because they do it over so many different channels and they do it so well. And a lot of it comes down to sort of leveraging their connections and the sort of pre-existing fan communities that are out there. Um, the next one we have is from... Colton, but then it looks like Colton says, just kidding. Yeah. Sounds like you're pretty much answering. So do you still have a question, Colton? Um, just the very short second one, which was, um, will it be possible for us to access the PowerPoint you did at some point in the future? Um, oh. the, the actual PowerPoint, yeah. Uh, yeah. I can email it to the emailing list if Richard's okay. Awesome. Yeah, yeah fine. I can That's send fine. that out after everything's done. Not Perfect. Yeah. Um, all right, next up was one from Kennedy. Do you want to read your own? Yes. Um, one of the big things that I've been wanting to do is I, uh, I was very interested in when you brought up like trying to introduce your product to or your project to Audible and BBC and so on and so forth. I've had middling to low success trying to even contact somebody in those departments. How would you go about trying to contact a big name production group like BBC or Audible or NPR or NPR? Do you need an audience beforehand or do accolades help put your foot in the door yeah. or do you just need to present the proof of concept? There, there's, there's lots of different levels for all of these. Um, I would say um, BBC obviously is a, it's a bit more tricky one if you're um, not based in the UK, but they will have open calls that are open to anybody in the UK. They have international calls um, that are for international competitions or sometimes for the world service again open to anyone there's some really good resources there um in terms of the bbc academy i think it's the episode with jessica Dromgool in it in which she takes you through one but also look at the bbc writers room because they that's an incredible resource really really good for audio drama uh and it gives you again the sort of sense of what they're looking for a, a really strong original voice is a lot of the time what they want but also someone who really listens and understands audio drama um, but then the, again this levels up if you're wanting to sell a series to them a, a a sort of or an original concept in which you have some ownership of the ip because bbc will take the ownership of the ip off you uh, if it's a just a general call um then you definitely need some kind of track record. Um, and you will need to be able to work with some of the networks there in terms of 
talking to the uh, commissioners individually uh, and they tend to work in a relatively small circuit. It's certainly not impossible to get in it, but you will need to be a preferred supplier to them beforehand. So you will, you'll need to have a track record of producing content. Um, in terms of Audible, um, lots of different levels. You, you can go straight in. You, you, you can certainly work through a publisher to um, put your audiobook on Audible, but then the problem, and I, I, Karim and I were discussing this earlier, problem then immediately is discoverability. Uh, yes, you may get people coming on to it every so often, um, but um, it's, it's, it's unlikely that you're going to get an awful lot of funding from it. Um, and also a, this, a lot of visibility. Now you can go through, you can be commissioned by them uh, in their or, originals range. If you go through commission, they will keep everything, but from a point of view of visibility, it's excellent. And as I say, it's, again, they work in relatively small circles. I can't speak for Audible, um, dot com. Uh, I know that there's a number of, people in the US who, who do have very good relationships with them, um, such as um, Fred Greenhalgh's crew and um, Lance Roger Axt. Um, in the UK, I know, know they're expanding, um, but once you get into that circle in terms of the originals range, uh, I have certainly seen writers that have been reoccurring quite regularly. Um, so again, in that situation, I would have thought that you needed a good number of prototypes elsewhere that would have sort of shown your uh, um, capabilities in that area. Uh, because obviously they'll be, they'll be helping you, they'll be able to put a lot of marketing to it, but um, they will want to know that it's a, a sure thing because they'll be investing quite a lot in the actors. So, they'll, so it would probably be best if you had more than just one prototype from like one concept or one series that you had built. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, to be honest, it, it all depends on how significant it is. If you take, um, I know before, I've forgotten the name of it, um, there was a sort of pr a production house recently that sort of wound itself up, unfortunately, a, a quite a large private one. I'm sure someone else will remember it. Um, it was John Dryden, who actually was working with um, Bright Sessions, purely because the Bright Sessions, you know, was so visible. <laughs> Uh, but it's very hard to achieve that with, on sort of one series. That was a number of series he's in. Um, generally, yes. And Panoply. Sorry? Panoply. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's move on to the next question if we can. That way we can try and get the ball rolling because we have a lot more questions to answer. Um, the next one is from Eric. Do you want to read your own question, Eric? Uh, yeah, I would, except that my power went out because of the storm. So I don't have the record. So would you I mind have reading it. it? I can do it. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Eric asks, what do you mean by reuse of IP, uh, adaptations or other licenses? Uh, well, there's slightly different concepts there. Um, in terms of reuse of your own IP, um, you know, over time, the fun, one of the funny things is, is that since 2009, certainly since sort of 2012, 14, people have been moving more and more into the idea of having series um, to take advantage mostly of things like crowdfunding platforms, particularly Patreon. Um, but it's uh, prior to that, it tended to be a case that people produced a lot of one-offs. You see that in ZBS in terms of wireless uh, theater, certainly in terms of big finish. Uh, some of the advantages of that is, although it's very much harder to crowdfund that, it's much easier to sell these one-off series because mm. they're a complete story in themselves. Um, and if you're building up a, quite a catalogue of that, and I would say that this, it's difficult to do that as a one-off creator, but if you're doing it as like a, a network or a sort of semi-network, then you can build after a while quite a range and you can then put a sort of subscription against that so wireless does have a subscription model in which you get years access to all of their content um as you as well as you pay in a certain amount or you can sell it on different platforms after and this, again you've got that long tail model in which um a lot of sales of lots of in small quantities of lots of different shows uh, after a while starts to stack up uh, so it's, as I say, it's, it's moving from a position in which you're constantly working in the now, you're, you're, you're having to constantly hype your show to a point in which you're developing and locking in an audience who are constantly 
wanting to use your old catalogue, but also wanting to see new stuff and trusting you to produce interesting new stuff. Wireless is a good example there. Great, thank you very much. Okay, um, the next one is from Sarah. Sarah, is it okay if I save that one until we're about to go into discussions because it's more about collaboration than it is about project funding? Yes, you're nodding and giving me the okay signal, great. So we'll go into the next question from Colton, which is actually for Liz, because we're on to her section of the presentation. Uh, Colton, do you want to read your own question? Sure thing. Um, yeah, you mentioned uh, that you would not recommend that Patreon be your, your sole revenue stream. And you said that you had a couple other ones um, by the time you got into that, um, or, or Kickstarter rather. Uh, can you give us an idea of what you were doing over the course of that first sort of prototype season to eventually establish uh, those revenue streams beyond just setting up crowdfunding? Um, yeah, so um, I mean, so the first disclaimer is, so I joined um, both Wooden Overcoats and Victoriosity for their second seasons to help with getting in funding. Um, I, I know what they, they did prior to that, but my, my experience has been very much um, on the funding side. Uh, so for both of the shows, actually, they had a similar model in the first season. Um, there was money that they had to spend to rent a studio and on hosting costs and all those, those other expenses. Um, and they established uh, live shows. So, I mean, Richard was saying that, um, you know, those can work depending on where you are. Uh, luckily, we're, well, Wooden Overcoats is London-based, uh, Victoriosity is in Oxford, but there's, they've both got traditions of kind of live performances, live comedy, so um, the first revenue stream was actually live shows, uh, and just bringing in some, some ticket revenue was enough to pay back the cost of the first season. In terms of um, laying it out as well, so really it was once the first season was released that we started thinking about monetization seriously. Um, we started doing small things. Um, we have an audio book on tape that's got USB. We got approached for that. Um, so the first season you can buy as a physical uh, copy. Um, I know there's, there's a couple other podcasters who are on this chat now that also have that product. Um, things like merch. Um, I don't, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I think you can put out it's, it's low effort to put out. You might not get a return immediately. Something like merch, there's plenty of websites that you can upload designs and it doesn't actually cost you anything and somebody might want a t-shirt. You might not be getting, again, a lot at the beginning, but if you've got the time to do it, it's something you can just put out there and see if some money comes in. Um, we also, you know, we had something simple like a donate button on the website. Um, I'm often surprised that people, more people don't have a donate button on the website. Uh, because weirdly, there are people who will listen to your show and go, hey, that's good. I want to give them money. I have personally been weirdly frustrated because there's a show that I listened to and I loved and could not find a way to give them my money. So something as simple as just having a donate button. Like, again, you might not be making huge, huge amounts, but it's a simple way to monetize. Um, and then I think, yeah, I think it's just having an, uh, being aware of being able to set up different things so that when you go forward and if you just do decide to monetize more fully, um, you, you have a direction, you have a plan. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Yes, thank you. Next we have a question from Kennedy. Yes, hi. <laughs> so um, one thing I've been terrified about crowdfunding personally is uh, that it requires constant attention. Um, a lot of my Pre-production is very slow burn. I'm, I'm working on with a writing team building like the world and stuff of my setting and I'm working with an animation team to try and produce some extra content on the side. But um, and I have to dedicate a lot of time towards those productions, but it's not exactly a showable capacity or anything that I can like really present as like, oh, this is like a completely polished thing. Um, my project is designed as a more traditional production. I can't really produce regular content as much as some other faster, cheaper productions. So how would I go about engaging my contri uh, contributors without them thinking I'm just spinning my wheels? Um, so uh, when you say more traditional, do you mean kind of like one uh, standalone series at a time or like a, you know, a, a season and then you take a break? 
Yeah, well, right now we did, uh, we made one season of Megas Elgar. It was like five and a half hours, 11 episodes, but they were like really intensely sound designed. And we had like a full yeah. cast of like 15 people. Um, and a lot of work was put into it. Yeah. But it took me a very long time to produce them because uh, I, I had to, I kind of had to work with it like it, as a hobby. Yeah. For my own, well, type, for my own job going. In many ways, I actually think that, um, that is a circumstance um, that something like one-off crowdfunding, like a Kickstarter, might be better for. One of the reasons why, for example, Wooden Overcoats is not on Patreon is because we do the very British thing of we release eight episodes uh, and then we wander away for a year uh, and then, you know, might eventually come back and make make more. But um, the fact that Patreon's ongoing, as, as Caitlin quite rightly said, if you're not releasing... I mean, you certainly can't charge um, the uh, Patreon, the uh, per creation fees. And if you're doing it monthly and people don't really know where you are, they're going to go away. So one of the reasons we're not on Patreon is we just, we're, we don't have the model that would sustain this kind of ongoing, um, ongoing contribution. Mm -hmm. I think you do need to have kind of ongoing release if you're doing that. But so, something like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, I think is good because you can, if you time it properly so that you do have something, you know, you, you don't want to run the campaign and then it's three years before it comes out. But if you time it properly and have a sense of your budget, um, you can crowdfund for a series. Uh, and then you know you have your money. You don't have to wait for it to come in later and you don't need to worry about timing that much. You can, you know, crowdfund, release your series and then, you know, vanish back into the dark until you're ready to do it again. Don't vanish into the dark, actually top tip, I mean, try and engage, but you know, you know what I'm saying. Um, you don't have to be as beholden to a regular release schedule. So I think that that's actually, in those circumstances, a, a useful thing to consider. Okay, thank you. All right, our next question is from Pacific. Sorry, um, do you mind if I just quickly add something on the back of Liz's one? Go Very quickly. <laughs> Very briefly, um, the thing I'd add is, I have a Liz. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's um, it's a lot of brain space to be producing the creative side and to be thinking about the business side of it. Uh, I mean, it's physically a lot of effort and time, but it's also mentally difficult to be putting yourself into the mindset of how do you then commercialize this thing. I think I've seen a lot of kind of couple teams that do this very well. If you're in a part of a bigger team, try to get somebody on board who's able to think in those terms because it's really, really helpful for a production. That would very be ideal because uh, right now I'm kind of like the sole creator of this project and I have to straddle between marketing, business model, um, nego negotiating with our publishers and actually making the thing. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it's there's there's it's useful i mean I, there's a there's sort of de bono's model in which you try to think of yourself in different spaces and i i must admit my own personal thing is i always try to think in terms of what mariella ronaker temple from wireless would do because she's brilliant at this kind of stuff but generally i would say really try to find somebody to take the effort off you uh, because it the temptation is always to have control over it um you, you've got to let that go if you're going to be able to expand it because you haven't got the capacity yeah i think that's right I'll, I'll poke in there as well. It's a skill set thing. Mm. Some people, that's the kind of thing they just do. Uh, mm. Some of us who are creatives, that's not our mindset. You know, it's like, I'm not a writer. I'm an actor. But you know, it's, it's, it's very I'm much... Not, I'm not a businessman. I bang pots together. Exactly. Yeah, right. and I, I like business and can't write. So that's the I am here. <laughs> so uh, go ahead, Pacific, with your question as well. Yeah, um, so actually kind of on that, so I'm losing my voice again. Uh, but for Kickstarter, what uh, platform-specific challenges did you face? And kind of on the heels of that, um, how much time did you uh, end up investing into the, uh, into the campaign, both pre- and post-launch? Right. Um, so platform-specific challenges, um, I think Kickstarter is... Once you've figured it out, like it's, it's pretty intuitive and once you figure it out, it's, it's kind of okay. Uh, one of the interesting things is obviously just trying to move your audio medium into quite a visual campaign as, mm -hmm. as Kickstarter and social media tends to be. Um, so things like a video, um, I think, as I said, I, I think they're 
they're important. Um, it, it's, it's people just tend to latch onto them. Um, but you know, we, we had to go and find a videographer. Is that a word? Videographer. Um, and you know, write that kind of script and, and, um, you know, we had to get graphics and things like that. And just trying to market your audio in visual format, I think was, was an interesting uh, thing to do. But I, on the whole, I think Kickstarter is actually pretty, pretty easy, um, uh, easy to, to, you know, design a campaign. Um, and how much time? Yes. Um, lots. We are uh, quite big production teams on both Wooden Overcoats and Victoriosity. Uh, I'd say... God, designing the campaign is many days of work. Um, and again, if you're doing a video, you gotta go and film it, and then it has to be edited, and you've gotta type out all of the rewards and argue with your collaborators who is going to make the rewards so you don't overcommit and uh, plan it all out and make sure that the titles are engaging. And it, it does take quite a lot of time when you launch again, you know, you, you really can't just let it free. You need to monitor it. You need to um, have a social media campaign on the side. Uh, so we tend to have a kind of constant, constant present presence online for that month. Um, so, you know, again, luckily there's lots of us. So when one person is at work, somebody else might take over with tweeting or whatever. Um, and then uh, once that ends, you've got to, well, actually make the thing, but also things like just fulfilling rewards can take a very long time. Um, you know, that, sorry. Um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, it's hard to put a figure on it. I do sometimes joke that, you know, if if all seven of us went and got a part-time job for the amount of time we put into a Kickstarter, you know, for all we know, we might raise the same amount of money. But again, it's trying to turn, it's about making this show into a sustainable business model um and i do think it's it's important to try and yeah it's it's part of the community it's part of of what we do and it's more fun than stacking shelves in a super supermarket so that's what we do all right our next question is from eric yeah so i was asking you know, whether you see Kickstarter is more uh, or just better than Indiegogo, but you did a really good breakdown in your presentation. So I'm gonna request I sub in a different question, kind of building on what Richard was saying too, is that what attracted you to join Wooden Overcoats or Victoriosity as like a business manager and, you know, monetary marketing producer to come on them in a second season or what would you want a show to offer you or someone like mm -hmm. you? Because we're really at that point where we can really <laughs> use a Liz to yeah. help ours fall get up, get up to another level. Um, I, I mean, I, I never thought I'd be that interested in like business and things like that, but I, I mean, this is, I guess a, a very personal answer. I don't know if it's super useful for people, but I find the, this new media that we're doing this this relationship that we are able to have with listeners really interesting and i also really want to help people make their cool stuff um you know i love the audio drama community i love the variety of voices that we're getting from it and i want people to be able to have the money that they need to build a show um I think there are there are others like me. There are people who um, who are you know who 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 are willing to see it as um, as as business. And again, I mean, I think often talking about business and talking about money within the arts, some people can see it as a kind of dirty word. But I, I think it is really that's the revolution. That's how we get away from the gatekeepers. Um, that's how we are able to go and make our our good stuff. Mm -hmm. What I would recommend, to be honest, I mean, first of all, yeah, talk to people and and try and find a Liz. There are also a lot of good resources out there where you can look into, you know, business, um, business of, of free, business of, of digital media. And um, I didn't know I would have an interest in this, and I did. So I think it's, you know, I'm happy to, to send out a reading list, give it a go, share it with your friends. Somebody will get super excited and go, yeah, long tail monetization. And uh, then you're there. 
Awesome. I would, I would, I would love that reading list. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you. All right. The next two aren't really questions. Uh, ignore my nonsense. <laughs> okay. uh, well. Then uh, I guess because they're not really questions, but uh, go ahead and read those comments if you could, Richard, because uh, some people might not be reading this, oh, be watching yeah, it, might yeah. just be listening. I've got to go and find them now. Um, yeah, I think one of them was about um, yeah the the inverse risk of uh, crowdfunding a, a Kickstarter at the start. Um, if you, if you if you've not got a product at all, is that you might be successful, <laughs> and you have no idea how much it actually costs or how much effort is involved in it. Uh, and I've seen that some things, you know, it doesn't often happen that you actually hit a big target with no product. But when it does, I've seen some really horrible things <laughs> then happen later on. Um, the, and so yeah, I, the other thing I just I I liked. Um, there's this concept there of awkward money uh, and I think that goes back to the sort of thinking about this as a commercial product that if it's not fully funded it's not a go up um, and I think sometimes it's useful to think in those terms I'd also say just to slightly add to that um, as it's useful to have a Liz it's also sometimes <laughs> uh, it's useful sometimes to actually think do you want to be a producer in that sense of not be the creator, not be the person who's writing this, not be the person who's sound designing it, have no involvement in the origination of the show, just be the kind of person who makes shows happen to make sure that they're a quality product and to put them in the right place, because there's not enough of those people in audio drama at all. Yeah, I, I, I wholly, wholly endorse that. Um, yeah, <laughs> come join me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, from that, that's a great segue into the next question from Travis, who is my producer, but he's going to go ahead and ask his question. <laughs> I, I love the, uh, the Ad Blast update, by the way. That's just so smart to like, here's something cool while we're telling you about our, our Kickstarter. In that vein, and sort of similar to Pacific's question, uh, what channels are most effective for marketing a Kickstarter, and also which ones are the most useless for time and return of time? Uh, I think it depends largely where your audience is. Um, so yeah, I do think, you know, drop something on your feed. That is definitely where your listeners are. Um, we have a large listener base on Tumblr, uh, but that demographic tends to be younger listeners who might not necessarily have as much disposable income. I get, it's very difficult to know exactly where the donors find us, um, but Twitter is great because it's, I think in many ways, slightly less intrusive because it's, it's almost a, a fleeting engagement. Um, so yeah, Twitter, we have good audience on Twitter. We have a Facebook group. So those three tend to be the most, um, you know, we have, we've tried things like Reddit. Reddit is not interested in us. Um, but again, I think that's possibly our shows and not necessarily true for, for other shows because I have seen, you know, a good fan bases on that. So I think it's just a question of, of go where your listeners are. Um, and again, try and think of ways of, of giving them something. So, you know, one of the things we do on Twitter, because it's a kind of fleeting medium it, and, you know, short little quotes is we might have a fun fact about the show or just something silly because that's kind of our brand and it's a way of again here's a little joke uh by the way we're doing a kickstarter uh and that can be you know there's not a huge amount of investment that can come and go facebook is is more permanent so we'll certainly post the video up there and we'll have campaign description we'll post the updates but we don't want to be posting every little fleeting thought because otherwise it's just our our facebook page is going to just be 200 posts of, of, you know, Kickstarter, Kickstarter, Kickstarter. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's hard to say which is the absolute best. I think it's just where your, where your, where your listeners are, where your audience is. If you're lucky, the donors will start sharing on your behalf uh, and then you can sit back and let momentum take, take effect. Liz, I think you just found your, your perfect thing for the next, uh, Wooden overcoats one, the fun fact, F U double N fact, of course. There you go. <laughs> See? Branding, we like it. All right. Um, was that 
good, Travis? Absolutely. All right. Um, the last question we have for Liz is from Colton. Colton, would you like to read your question? Yeah. Um, so this is kind of for, for uh, Liz and Richard and possibly uh, Caitlin as well, um, and maybe just anyone. Um, on, the, on the business side of this, um, and this may differ for the people who are in the U.S. versus the U.K., et cetera, um, but how did y'all go about um, handling finances in like a legal and tax sense? Um, did you incorporate early on or was there a point where it became clear that you needed to do that? Um, wh where does the money actually go and has that ever changed or have your thoughts on that changed? Yeah. I'm going to base, I'm going to base this off of your accent that you're American. Um, <laughs> so uh, I would like to also bring Travis in on this because he is the producer for the, for what I create. We have incorporated. Um, so we are Cool Scholar LLC. Yeah. Yep. Do you want to? Yeah, LLCs are, are pretty cool. Depending on the state you live in, if you're in a state that's like taxable, maybe if you have a friend with a postage address that's not quite as taxable, that could be helpful to you. So you're not taxed twice on the money you only receive once. Um, I, I don't want to say like cheat the IRS, don't cheat the IRS, but uh, certainly if you have the opportunity to incorporate, like we have family and friends in Florida, so we are a Florida LLC that makes a lot of sense for us because a lot of our actors are Florida actors and we have a physical address. So we are Fool and Scholar Productions LLC. It was $150 to incorporate. You need a physical address. You need uh, people who actually own the business. You can be a sole proprietor. You can be a partnership. You can be a corporation. And uh, the, the short version is, um, that's that's kind of how you you look at it and if you're a sole proprietor you are the entity the tax entity so if you're losing money on your podcast well cool you, you're losing money on your taxes and it's a losing business so that sort of helps you out but it also sort of is not fun that you're losing money but it it can be helpful from a tax perspective and i can get super deep into specific areas but i don't that's that's probably a good basic answer I would say the most important thing is, especially when you're first starting off uh, and you've created a, a business with your podcast in the U.S., is that you actually get to start writing off business expenses for your podcast, which can really be, be helpful in the long game. Um, otherwise, yes, it can be like many other small businesses that are first starting off, where the reason that you incorporate is just because you need, you need to start writing those off to stop, start offsetting the cost of creation. Um, even when if it's, if it's a hobby model, it can still be good to incorporate because you do plan on taking it further in the future, but maybe you're not at that stage yet. Um, and then Richard and Liz might also want to chime in for the UK listeners. Uh, yeah, so um, Wooden Overcoats and Victoriosity are incorporated. Um, when we started getting money in, um, I made them incorporate um, because, so fun and important fact, um, things like Kickstarter donations are taxable. That is, that is income. So don't think that just because people are giving you money on the internet, that's free money. It is not free money. Patreon uh, also sends you tax forms. Yeah. So um, as soon as there's money, because there's so many of us working on wooden overcoats, we really, we need a central place to hold the money. We didn't want one person to have to deal with, you know, uh, this income on their taxes. Also, there's a question of um, limited liability. So when we monetize, we also started signing contracts with sponsors you know, our live shows, we had to get event insurance and things like that. And it was easier to do through a company because if you get sued in a limited liability company, they can only sue the extent of the company and not you personally. Um, not that we were intending to get sued, but when you do start operating with, you know, sponsor contracts and stuff, you just, it's nice to have that level of protection. Um, so that is definitely worth um, paying attention to. Oh, okay. And Richard? It's mute. Sorry. Oh, you're still muted. Can you unmute before you start? Right. right. Um, yeah. I, and I know that there's an interesting story around um, wooden overcoats in terms of getting incorporated after things have been in train, which makes things interesting. Um, for myself, I'm just a writer, so I tend to work as a sold agent. Um, there is something that we may be uh, sort of setting up as a social enterprise soon. Um, but uh, broadly speaking, as I say, in terms of thinking about what you want to do, I'm not in any rush to actually set myself up as a business in this situation. I'd, I'd rather join in other productions. 
All right. So that is the last question for that section, which means we're moving on to where I started. But this first question is for all three of us, and it is from Colton. I'll talk again. Um, yeah. Um, so all of you talked uh, to some extent about the importance of building a, a community, especially for crowdfunding, the idea that you need to build these relationships with your listeners. Um, is there anything specific you would recommend as a good way to do that besides the show itself and Twitter engagement? I think those are kind of the standard avenues, but are there other things that you think do a great job of building those relationships? Mm -hmm. This is the um, question I think all people are asked. <laughs> and we always have either very different or the exact same answer, which is just create good content and tell people about it. Because if you don't tell people about it, they're never going to listen to your good content. But if your content is good, it doesn't matter if you tell them because they're not going to stay. Um, it's just that that one single little circle uh, that is all of podcast listeners. Uh, that's not um, an answer. No, I, I mean I, I think that is rule number one: like make make something good. Um, but one of the concepts that I actually think is worth um, mentioning is is what I brought up with. Um, in uh, advertising your Kickstarter, which is the kind of give and take concept. Um, I think a lot of people, you know, there, there are some shows that will just kind of smash into Twitter and go, we have a show, we have a show. And, you know, um, it's a lot better if you are, it's a lot easier to ask for attention when you are giving something. So go on social media, don't just say our show, our show, talk about other shows you like talk about the industry, engage in conversations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you are seen as a, an active and useful member of the community, people will go, oh yeah, that show, I should check out that show. Um, and yeah, if you, if you write articles, if you've got, you know, something interesting to share, do that because it's a lot easier to ask for attention when you give something. And uh, yeah. you're already part of a, a wonderfully uh, interactive community, the audio drama community already talks with each other a lot. So it's easy to get on board and join in on other conversations people are having and be very helpful, but also receive something in the end. Um, but I mean, it's, we're already such an open community on Twitter and Facebook. I mean, we're already doing something like this. So it's easy to get your word out there and also be helpful and ask questions and build yourself up. So, and yes, Richard, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Oh, no, 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 there's no way. So you, you, you would have most experience, but I'd just say that there's a, there's a wider range of tools in terms of it. I mean, there's, um, we're talking about live performances earlier, anywhere where you have actual one-to-one -one engagement, they don't necessarily make money, but the extent to which it actually builds up a sense of loyalty and a sense of ownership in your production is, is amazing. Um, with regular updates, surprise updates, um, uh, and invitations, of course, to performances. Um, I have to say, it's also worth looking at some of the ones like, um, say, Bright Sessions. Bright Sessions are very good at uh, marketing and building a post sense of community. Um, but also, I just wanted to add one which is a bit different from the others, which is think about which audience you also want to be building up a community with. Because one of the things that Wireless did, which was a bit different, was that they actually essentially hired, brought in an industry advocate to essentially glad hand around the BBC and other sort of large industry bodies so that and and other actors particularly so they've got a one a number of sort of named patrons that are, are very well known in the industry and they did all of the professional networking for them that they could wheel them in for events so it's a completely different audience for building up a community but the industry is still a um, an audience awesome thank you Okay, our next question is from Sarah. Oh, is Sarah here anymore? Yes. She is? Sarah, do you want to read your question? Oh, Sarah, I don't know if Sarah can hear me. You can read it. Okay, I'll, I'll, I will read it then. Um, for Patreon, my demographic uh, is poor or unpaid voice actors. I have a plan to roll out more connections, but being one person, just I just don't have the time with balancing everything together, making, creating, acting, and mummying. Oh yeah, she's a mum. Um, 
she's trying to find audience in other areas, but it feels weird asking producers to encourage their casts uh, to listen and invest, I guess, to invest time and money because you're talking about Patreon. Um, and I saw today about the new Payoneer system. Does that mean I also get a better pound, 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 so dollar, dollar, dollar rate? And is it worth doing? I have not heard of the Payoneer system yet. If it came out today, uh, then I have not have not have had time yet to look it up. Um, I would say that you do have a very strange demographic, but it's also a very large one. Um, in the same way that Sarah Werner has her writing podcast where she's usually talking to people who aren't professional writers, who are just people who want to find the time every day to, to write a little bit more. Those are the people that maybe don't have a lot of money to give to a Patreon, but she still does a very good job with working towards making them feel appreciated and building a community, which then makes it feel as though, oh, I should be giving back to her because she's given so much to me. So that's actually the give and take of Patreon itself. Um, that's the same problem that a lot of people on Patreon have as well when maybe their demographic is very young and they don't have their, their own money so they can't put money onto Patreon and things like that. <sighs> and I, I can't think of a, a good way to say if they have no money, you can't really get money from them. But one way is that you could look at, okay, how are you expanding the, your possible audience? You're, you're talking about teaching people how to do voice acting, but are you also talking to producers about how to choose the right voice actors? Are you talking to writers about how to envision what kind of voice they want in their show? So there's definitely ways to open up your audience to uh, a larger range of people who might be able to apply what you're teaching to their life and then increase your audience and increase your conversion rate. So could I, I hope that- Could I also add there? Oh yes, go ahead. Um, yeah, um, I'd, I, I mean, I'd, I don't know if Sarah's done that yet, but Certainly, I mean, the voice acting community for audio dramas um, that are sort of the, the non-professional, non-BBC type circle is tends to be a lot of people doing things voluntarily. But there is an awful lot of people who are fully paid and do this on a very professional basis for audio books, as, as sort of Caitlin was saying about a, way, a wider audience for television, animation. There, there's there's got to be a large amount of people who are regularly doing animations who might need these tips. Also, uh, I know um, there are a lot of services which are just going around the drama schools uh, and not engaging with those clients, but dealing with the schools and actually engaging with them and thinking what they specifically want. So it's who you're targeting. Also, I've done a real quick uh, Google search on Payoneer. Um, and sort of how it interacts with Patreon. Uh, the short of what I've seen so far is it, as of earlier in the year, uh, last year, 2018, it took 5% and there's some discussion if it's better than using PayPal because uh, PayPal also takes a, a percentage when you transfer money from Patreon to your bank account and how it gets there. And I don't exactly know which one has the best rates, but there's some discussion from some people in Ireland on Reddit. Um, okay, so the next question is from Kennedy. Are you, where are you? There you are. Would you like to read your question? Uh, sure. <clears throat> so I've been hearing a lot of things about uh, never do physical uh, rewards and stuff, especially for an audio uh, drama, which makes sense to me. I don't think I really have enough time shoving things into packages. Um, but what kind of rewards would you recommend for a Patreon? I contemplated making some small cheap segments about lore in my setting or bloopers or other things like that. And I imagine that there would only be a certain amount of mileage for that kind of thing. So we do bloopers and our patrons really like them uh, because we are a horror show. It really takes them out of the, the norm of the show and they feel very engaged and they find it very humorous. So bloopers are fun, but that has to rely on how many you get. So it's, uh, it's usually an uneven amount over time. So some of your actors might be incredibly humorous, uh, but then if that actor is no longer on your show after a season, maybe you only have five minutes worth of bloopers for four episodes. So that can be incongruous. Um, I know that I think Greater Boston does monologues and people seem to enjoy those a lot as well. Um, similarly with what Liz was saying for Kickstarter, people like it when they get more of what they already like. Mm -hmm. So 
for a Patreon if you create a horror story or if you create a sci-fi or a, uh, a comedy then they probably want to hear more horror, sci-fi, or comedy. They want something that's exclusive to them, or it's exclusive to not, maybe not Patreon in general, but to people who support. So to supporters, maybe not just patrons. So perhaps um, maybe maybe a short or something in lieu of the same kind of genre or even in the same universe, just not yeah. directly associated with what they have. Yeah, or what so we have a red, for our main story. Exactly. We, we do that and we call them mini series. So it's set in the same world, but it's a smaller series that's for our supporters. And people really latch onto that because they get access to more of the lore and the parts of our world that our, our main audience does not. So that's something to people latch onto. Um, another thing is digital rewards that are already easy for you to create. So whatever your skill set is or somebody on your team's skill set, so with us, we play a lot of uh, Dungeons and Dragons. So we make Dungeons and Dragons modules for our, our fans so they can play games in our world. And apparently our fans are pretty nerdy. So that works pretty well. Um, it also applies for things like, okay, so if we make pamphlets or artwork for our world that can be sent to them in PDF files or in digital files, we don't have to ship anything out, but they still get to enjoy and view and interact with that media. Um, but yeah, so Patreon is actually going to be rolling out very soon their own merch fulfillment. They've already rolled it out onto several, uh, I think they've only started with five Patreons and it's their alpha program. And they're gonna start rolling that out in the future where they will start fulfilling and shipping Patreon rewards for you as a creator. But you have to pay to be a part of the program and the money does already come out of what you're supposed to be taking out of your, like what is coming out of your Patreon to you. So again, it's a big hit to that difference between what you see on your page and what you take home. Mm -hmm. um, was that a good answer for you? Yeah, that's a fantastic answer. Thank you. I, I, I had some prototypes in mind of what I would do if I managed to get a Patreon going in case I wanted to. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but yeah, if, if I would go down that route, that'd be very, that's, that was very helpful. Thank you very much. Of course. Um, next up is Eric. Would you like to read your question? Absolutely. So, um, Marcel's at its mid season finale right now. Uh, we're going to release that in a couple of days. So we're taking a six week break. And, um, I know Caitlin and Travis, we had talked about this like a month ago, the kind of more detailed of the difference between per creation and per month. And uh, I believe you had recommended at that time that we should really consider to moving to per creation since we drop, we're running a season now, we're dropping two episodes every month. So uh, my question is, do you think this would be a good time to move over to that model since we're taking the six week break and we are planning to drop at least one mini episode, if not two during this break as well. So that would allow us to collect on those creations. Okay. I would say first, I am most apprehensive when you brought up mini episodes, most people don't feel comfortable paying the same amount mm. that they would for a normal episode and paying for a mini episode. Okay. Um, so when we do things like our mini series, that's in addition to normal episodes because we feel like that's their reward for joining, but we don't want to decrease what they feel like they're paying for. Um, as for, yeah, you have a, a six week gap. You're so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> we had to, it, this, it had to happen. <laughs> you have a six week gap. Um, have you polled your patrons to see how they would feel about the transfer? No, we haven't. I would say first thing you should do, even now while you're still releasing is find out if they would feel comfortable with that. Um, most people, if they're there because they enjoy you personally, because like I said, you are the major draw, is that they trust you as a creator. Um, most people probably won't have a problem with it. The people who will have a problem with it are usually your higher tier supporters, because if they're going from paying you $5 a month to $10 a month, because of now you're doing twice a month, it's gonna be double. That's not so much of an issue with people at the $1 level who go from one to two, not too bad but five to 10 is a lot worse. Um, pull your patrons, find out how they feel. And if you're going to do it, then you need to make them feel like it's worth it. 
Great. You can't just switch and assume that they're going to be happy with paying more for what feels like less. But also, if you feel like you're going to be growing substantially soon, do it before you hit that new growth spurt, so before you start the next season. Because when new people sign on, they won't have to know that it used to be monthly model. Great. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, oh, the next one's from you as well. <laughs> oh, uh, oh yeah, you already said that the slides will be available, so. Yes, okay. Uh, Great, Pacific. thank you. <laughs> the specific Pacific, Pacific uh, is gone. Okay. Go. All right, so he, he did ask though, how often do you run public stre live streams to draw people to Patreon? Is it effective market um, the you more off of Patreon or on? On Patreon, send out videos, send out little pictures, show people what your really horrible setup looks like because it humanizes you. Um, we do live streams to draw people from Twitter or something over to our Patreon, but we don't actually draw them. We just say we're doing a live stream because we want to do the Q&A or we want to tell you something cool. But we will mention our Patreon because we are still trying to work in those conversion factors. Um, Patreon is not really the site to try and make patrons. That doesn't really make any sense. What I'm trying to say is you have to send people to your page, then your page has to do its job. But there's no way to really put something on your Patreon that's just gonna automatically draw people over to it. Patreon does let you do a video just like a Kickstarter does. Your video has to be good. I know that sounds so dumb to say, everybody knows it, but if your video is it, we had video that was just Travis and I sitting down and talking. It looked horrible. We updated our video. We saw an actual boost in our conversion rate because it showcased more of our work, but it also showcased us. It showcased our voices and the voices of our work in comparison to just showcasing us in a slightly unprofessional manner. Um, well, that's what growth means, guys. Uh, I'm sorry. I think, I think it was hard trying because he was a little bit sick. So I feel bad that I waited so long to get to this question. They, they also have Periscope uh, built into certain apps. Um, well, Periscope is for Twitter. They have a, a Periscope light. It's like a 30 or 15 second button you can hold down and make a short video for Patreon. And some people like them, but it's not going to convert any new patrons. It's just a thing you can use to keep sort of the community going. Our next question is from Eric. You have a lot of Patreon questions, there. <laughs> I do. We really rely on that. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have not linked to Discord or Reddit, and I know you mentioned that earlier, or maybe I misunderstood. Um, but my thing is that we do have a Discord channel that was created by fans, and I kind of lurk in there. We haven't directly interacted with them because I feel like a little uncomfortable. Um, so I'm just wondering, <laughs> in your experience, have you, you know, interacted with fans directly on Reddit or on Discord or other, some kind of platform like that. Like we do it on Twitter, but we have our whole kind of mask of the show. I'm just worried of like fans asking like really questions and I don't want to be like, oh, I can't tell you because it's a spoiler or if we're going to make people uncomfortable being like, oh, there's a creator like lurking in the chat, which um, I guess is what I'm doing, but they don't know this. <laughs> uh, we, we, we have a Discord and a Reddit. Um, I am not a Discord savvy person at all. But I did set it up and I got it working. Um, and sometimes people chat in there. So thank you to those people who do. <laughs> yeah. But I, I do know how to use Reddit. I actually set up our subreddit. Um, I post all of our episodes to the subreddit. I post mm. about really important updates to the subreddit. We have people interacting and subscribing to our subreddit. They'll put their own posts in with questions. They'll talk about what they think is going on in the lore of the world. Sometimes they ask questions that I just reply with, I can't tell you right now, that would be a spoiler. Mm, okay. And usually people are like, oh, okay, yeah, don't tell me yet. They don't want to be, they don't want to spoil the experience of the show. If they're already so much of a fan that they're on your subreddit and they're talking to you, they probably don't want it to be spoiled, but Reddit is a wonderful community. I know Liz said that it didn't seem to work for her, but I've actually seen people on Reddit gushing out love for wooden overcoats in Victoriosity. Um, it is a very active, wonderful community. There's the, um, the, the podcast subreddit, the audio drama subreddit. Uh, you can set up your own personal subreddits for your shows. 
and those allow smaller communities within larger communities to interact and talk and share information and ideas and it honestly is a, a great way to build that community that you need for patreon conversion it kind of Can connected I? oh yeah go ahead Yes. No, I didn't want to interrupt. I just, um, I wanted to add something about um, engaging in, in fan spaces, if that's useful. It's not directly about Patreon, but um, I mean, uh, I think people might disagree with this view, but um, we have always taken the view that fans should have their own space if, if they want it. So things like our fan, there's a fan discord. We don't, we leave them to it. Uh, we also, things like um, Instagram or Twitter, if they add us, then we take that to mean that they want our attention, so we will engage. If they don't add us, we kind of leave them to it because, you know, there's, there's certainly fan spaces where clearly they want to talk to each other um, and not necessarily, yeah, have the creator, you know, I think come in and gooseberry on their fan fiction or whatever it might be. Right. Um, so... But I mean, again, people might disagree. I think I've seen shows that have, you know, a fan set up Discord that does its own thing and then an official Discord. So yeah, basically, if you want to talk to creators, you can go find them in this place and you know that they'll, they're paying attention. But if you want to spend your time, you know, talking about your latest theory or your latest ship or whatever it is, you can do that in your own kind of like safe fandom zone. And I think there's merit in that. It's just my two cents. Great, that's that's really helpful. And on that note, um, since we had a fan set up Discord and we also had a fan set up a Reddit for Marsfall, if we were going to get more involved, would you recommend we set up official ones or try and like take those over or <laughs> take uh, over is the wrong word? <laughs> I, I would recommend uh, first, how good is their subreddit tag? So, did they do they have Marsfall? Is that their they have Mars Fall is awesome. Is there okay? Subject? Well, then you can probably just set up a Mars Fall if it's available. Yeah. Um, that way, you have an official channel to post new episode links. You have an official channel to maybe probe the the audience with questions. Um, Mars Fall is awesome. While humorous, <laughs> may not be the the professional front you're trying to put out into the world. Right. Uh, <laughs> but you can definitely approach them and say, we're so happy that you made this. Just so you know, we're going to set up an official one. Um, you've inspired us to do so because we would love for, for all of the, these people who love our show to also interact with us on our subreddit. Um, so you can just say that you as a creator feel more comfortable doing it in your own form in, as opposed to something run by a fan. That's great. That's really, that's smart to tell them that. Thank you. No, can I jump in on the on your Discord front? Yes, you know way more about Discord than I do. <laughs> All right, so I don't know what most of the other shows are. I know a good portion of them, but we are we're an actual play, so we do weekly releases. We're actually super unusual for that. Um, we decided to go down the Discord route. Um, we found subreddit didn't work, and there are crazy people on subreddit. I love you guys. You're crazy. Um, we found Discord. Um, Discord's really good for us because we found that we can link it into our Patreon. So yes. Patreon has Discord specific rewards, which get you into certain channels. So if they want to ask you a question, and it could be a spoiler related question, then they can put those in the AMA. If you decide you want to do like a monthly Q&A thing, you can easily do it on Discord. A lot of people have Discord. They don't have to go through to Patreon or anything like that. And you can, you can ping it and ping it on there. Um, we found that since we started engaging in our discord there are four th there are four of us that do the show there are three of us that are very very heavy active in our discord we found that the more we've interacted on the discord the higher conversion from the discord we had over to patreon um quite massively uh but being the fact that they had a special channel to themselves and other people like we want to know what the hell's going on there because we would just start meaning and stuff people want to know um being that i am the uh dm i i run the show so to speak um and i'm also the producer of it uh i get asked a lot of questions that i can't comment on and often i just say i can't tell you or I'll just do our tagline which is i guess we're about to find out like we have those like things in place like they know they can t kind of ask us anything but they also know that we can't seriously answer them um so as creators when they go we ship these two characters together we're just like oh this is the best thing ever so people start doing oh me join in on that even though they know that we can't actually be serious about that though we can't seriously ship our two main characters together. They have bare 
vastly different interests, but we join in on their, their community on that. Um, and it's, it's great fun. And say that level of interaction with them has been insane. Um, when we decided to launch our Patreon, which we did after our Discord, it blew up because of Discord first. Uh, we went from, I think in the first month, like one or two dollars to hitting our stretch goal in two months, um, which was uh, scary because it meant writing a whole new side campaign all at once. Um, I highly recommend Discord, but you have to be active. And I don't know if that translates across very well to the rest of you who do seasons and series, like here's a bunch of time we're producing and then we're stopping for a bit. What we have the advantage is just that we can keep talking week after week after week after week. Um, if you can keep that going in your off season, you're going to be like laugh, an absolute laugh, right? Um, yeah, I, I highly recommend Discord, but you do need to be active in it. And it is a good way of building your Patreon community, I guess, because there's a place for them to go. Yeah. There you go. And unlike, that's, that's Discord. <laughs> unlike Reddit, um, you, like she said, you can actually directly connect a Discord to your Patreon. They have that ability built into the system. So that is a plus for people who know how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank uh, you so much, Ham. That was that's really helpful. <laughs> you're welcome. As so I think we have a slight advantage on that over, I think, some of those short form uh, series that you guys do because we have every week and we have a system to fall back on. But we have an off channel where people talk about the most random stuff I've ever seen in my life. Um, these guys are hilarious and they seem to really appreciate the one-on-one -on -one input that they get with us. So there you go. Have fun. If you have any more Discord questions. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I definitely will DM you. <laughs> I think our last, oh, this isn't a question, but our last thing in the, in the chat section, and then we can open it up to if anybody has anything new that hasn't been put in here yet, um, is one thing that Richard said about uh, Sean Howard. So if you want to tell people about that. Oh, you're muted. Yes. Um, yeah, no, it's, I mean, just to add to some of the great stuff that um, Ken has been saying, it's, they, I know uh, Sean's been spending a lot of time thinking about this and the sort of various reward levels and what's happened. And there's, there's some quite striking graphics in terms of what he's been able to achieve there. Um, so it's w definitely worth looking at that blog. Also, probably anything by Gabriel Abina in terms of Wolf 359 as well. It's another people who have given a lot of thought to Patreon levels. Yeah. Sean also gives away a free marketing book on like how to grow your yeah. brand if you subscribe for free to his mailing list. You get the book for free. Yeah, yeah I've, I've worked on a, uh, we sat down and had a small Patreon consultation where we talked everything out. He is very knowledgeable on the subject uh, and he runs some wonderful shows. So yes, I also recommend that. So when I turn this into a video, I will try to put a link somewhere in the video. <laughs> Um, so now that we're at the end of the chat section, um, or the, the question section in the chat, if anybody has something else that they wanted to touch on, we've been here for almost an hour and a half. So bravo on everyone who's, uh, over in England. <laughs> and, uh, yes, if you have more questions or anything that you feel like we should discuss, one of the things that, oh, okay. Uh, we will talk to some of you at a later date. Bye guys. <laughs>
if you do have something that you want to talk about, we can do that. <laughs> um, yes. Just a, a sort of side thing. Um, I feel like in the past like year or so, I've seen a lot of companies or startups that uh, pitch themselves as the, the Netflix for audio drama um, to the point that I kind of feel like someone someday will do this. Um, I don't know which one, but like logically, it seems like one of them will do it. Um, we kind of sort of are, are uh, that, uh, partnered, we're, we're sponsored by a company called Tapable for this podcast I'm working on right now um, as just sort of an upfront thing. Um, particularly because I think the struggle that a lot of those platforms have is that they say like we're Netflix for audio drama um, and you say well I, I have Netflix for audio drama it's iTunes um, and uh, there's not really a good answer to that um, and I think what Tape is trying to do is sort of build a, a Patreon-esque model where they have like an advertisement free version of shows and that kind of thing. Um, do y'all think that we're going to see, see that really take off uh, in a big way in the future? Um, do you think those kind of like aggregate networks are going to be a big thing? Um, or do you think we're, we're probably going to stick with the model we have now? Personally, um, from what experience I've been seeing, because I, I have to talk with a lot of uh, publishers and other things like that, I think what we're overdue for is an exodus from Audible, considering that I've heard a lot of people who have to kind of play ball with Audible and iTunes in order to get themselves visible, at least from the uh, pay-per-view market that I'm in. Um, many of them are not really happy about how restrictive that environment is because you don't get to choose your pricing. You don't really get much control of your optics about that. And then basically you're the one taking all the risk. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking it's a matter of time that we have somebody start footing a, a Netflix model for audio dramas, but it would have to come from somebody with a massive amount of popularity and visibility. So I imagine it would probably be somebody like the wonderful people at um, uh, Welcome to Night Vale or Casey Wayland over at We're Alive to help uh, be kind of the sponsor to be like, this is a good idea that we want to go down. Mm -hmm. Can I clarify a question with you? When you say the Netflix of podcasting, do you mean a subscription service or do you just mean the central hub where this is where you're going to find your next show? Um, a little of both, uh, like what Tapable is doing that I think is kind of cool is like they're, they're implementing or they're hoping to implement like a, a rich audio experience, um, that it, like, as you listen to a show, it'll pop up and say like, Hey, here's a fun fact about this scene or whatever. Or like, um, you can like listen to a transcript or you can listen to the show and have a transcription scroll over the screen simultaneously or whatever. Um, essentially just like right now, uh, if you're listening to audio drama, you kind of get to that via your podcast app or via SoundCloud or whatever. Um, and I think uh, I've seen a lot of services, Tapable and StoryMore are the two that are coming to mind, but um, they basically say like, we're going to be an app that just does audio drama, whether it's a paid service or free, we're just going to aggregate all of the audio dramas that are out there and improve your listening experience. Um, so for my part, I think, yeah, there, I've also spoken to a lot of Netflixes of audio drama. I think there's a couple that are coming up that seem to do that seem to have you know m money behind them, and I think you know mm. in the brutal capitalist society that might be the difference. <laughs> um, so one of a book I'm actually reading right now, which I will mention for the sake of the reading list that I assume you will all go away and uh, partake in, is a book called Free by uh, Chris Anderson, and that's about the free economy. Um, and how money comes from giving away things for free, which is what we do. I think podcasts are free, that they are, um, and I don't think that uh, it's going to be an easy transition for people to suggest that we start paying for them. The book suggests that really the way that you would get, you know, subscription, you know, a, 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 a sincere transfer of listeners to something like a subscription model is it really has to be either much better or much easier to mm. listen. Um, easier, I mean, it's not hard to listen to a podcast. We still, of course, have the issue about discoverability. So yes, if, if there's a platform that can do a Netflix style algorithm that will immediately suggest to you your next obscure audio drama that you're gonna love, maybe that will do it. Um, in terms of better, you know, there are kind of big name audio dramas, but there's nothing I don't know if there's anything I could I could think of that would absolutely guarantee that I would throw my money at, at, at subscription. Um, you know, it, it would be nice to see these things. It would be nice to see kind of um, regulated platforms. But I think the fact that audio dramas are so 
easily made and put out for free. It's going to be tough. I don't know. It's interesting. I'm just thinking out loud, but I think it's, it's interesting, but I, I, I won't hold my breath. I've been talking with a, uh, a group. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Chinese podcast market, but Zamlaya translates to English as Himalaya and Zamlaya is the largest mm. podcasting app in China. Himalaya is their American counterpart. Um, I'm under NDA, NDA, so I can't say a lot of the cool stuff, but I've been talking with them, and some of the things I can say are they're really trying to encourage transition onto their platform, and if you're on their platform, they're also working really hard to make it so that they can monetize, not by inserting dynamic ads and all that stuff necessarily, but by that, that is a part of what all the apps want to do, but their their real big push is if you have merchandising or you have exclusive content and you're selling it on their platform, they get like a small cut and that funds them, but it also funds you in app without having to go to a Patreon or a third party site. I was really impressed by talking with them and they're also looking to talk to more podcasters and they're also, I downloaded the app and I, I found it to be a decent platform because um, if I'm going to say something is good, I should use it and put my money where my mouth is. But I've been impressed. I would like to think that they're the one uh, being from China. I think they have the backing financially, um, given how podcasting in China is so different than in the U.S. Will it transition over? I don't know. Will they win? I don't know. Will Story more, you know, come in with a left hook? We'll find out. But uh, either way, I, I think we are centralizing away from iTunes, at least eventually, even though it is currently, what, or they'll have to improve significantly from where they are if mm -hmm. they like to maintain. To that effect, too, um, a lot of what Travis said uh, applies to the new Google platform that released, I believe, last uh, fall. And um, we also, I can't elaborate any more than Travis said, but pretty much a lot of that applies to Pandora, which we, they are also accepting podcast submissions. We're currently on their NDA and they're looking to, you know, make this a monetizable market. So I do think we're getting a lot closer to that cusp of something like that coming through. But as Travis just said, I have no idea who the winner is. And, but I think, you know, something like Himalaya or Pandora or Google that has a big established present and a large financial backing is going to be a much safer bet or something at least worth exploring as opposed to a lot of these startups that are just kind of rolling out now that I've never heard of before. I think the incon inconclusive answer is that we're, we're going to have to wait to see how the platform war uh, goes and see who's left standing uh, and hope that it's better for us as podcasters, mm -hmm. not just for podcast listeners. So. Next. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wanted to add something earlier to what, um, going way back to Liz's presentation of talking about running a Kickstarter or Indiegogo at the same time as a Patreon. So we did that for our season two. We, we did an Indiegogo and it was actually, we'd already recorded all of season two. So we were doing that really uphill battle of like, if you pay us for something, we're definitely gonna release. <laughs> um, but we found out the angles that we marketed was that also like having a donate button on the website, there are people and it's generally people that are older, like a, a generation, um, you know, probably like baby boomers or um, Gen Xers even that prefer donating these one-off amounts and they feel safer about that. And we found that a lot of people that supported us on the Indiegogo were not people that were Patreons or patrons because they weren't as comfortable with doing a monthly thing, but they'd rather just drop, you know, a set amount by either donating to our PayPal directly or supporting us on Indiegogo. And um, also to that effect, we personally, and this might be anecdotal, but we found the biggest amount of money that we saw going to the Indiegogo came from newsletters, not from Twitter blasts, not really from Facebook, but like sending out newsletters is where we saw the biggest direct peak in people funding our Indiegogo. So just something to throw out there. Yeah. I don't know if anyone else has seen things like that. That's super useful. And and it's actually really useful to hear um you talk about doing the Patreon and the and the Indiegogo. Again, I'm not yeah, I definitely don't think it, it's um I mean clear, clearly it can work. 
and I think that's great. I, I find that interesting. I actually, personally, I don't really like being a patron because I don't care that, that much about, like, Liz? Oh, you're frozen. Sure. Can you pause for a moment? He's <laughs> 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 oh, <okay. laughs> the matrix. Um, if you would oh. like to try and turn your camera off and on again. Oh, that's a super, that's a super like there. This is like, she's probably giving us the best information right here. But I've also seen worst freezes on Zoom, so. Yeah. <laughs> it's, such a, it's like an EDM piece now. <laughs> right? Okay, I think she got to. Okay. <laughs> she's back. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, uh, everyone. I told you right. this happens every time I do these chats. I don't know what's wrong with my internet. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Just, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Can you, uh, you just do your we whole miss, uh, We missed the magic <laughs> apple. The key. Yeah. She said it and we all missed it. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's my best insight and you've, you've missed it now. Sorry. Um, yeah. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> Um, one thing I could say about the uh, the newsletter but, thing, uh, I've been I've actually been experimenting with this a lot myself. One one that was a bit challenging to go for right away was to convince people to jump onto the newsletter in the first place. Um, I've got a, I've got an offer on my front page right away. But one thing that I do to incentivize people to join is I offer a a discount code for one of the versions of my show if they sign up for the newsletter, and that usually is pretty successful whether or not they even take advantage of the, of the promotion. Um, aside from that, just having regular content to show them has always been a bit of a unceasing struggle. But I've actually found that a lot of my, the people that use my um, newsletter uh, don't mind if I don't update aggressively. Like just having, having quality over quantity on the newsletter has, has been absolutely essential for them at least <laughs> i maintained a newsletter for four years and i i had a really low conversion rate because it was a list garnered from going to conventions yeah and people would use signing up for the newsletter as a means of getting out of the conversation so I, <laughs> just as as a word of advice how you gather your list is incredibly important like i had thousands of names but i tell you like i i got unsubscribers in the hundreds every time i put anything out I remember those days. Let's never go back. Dark times. <laughs> so just be really careful about how you put your list together and that they're actually voluntary people who might be interested in your stuff. Because otherwise your Good email point. that you use to send it out will suddenly get like triggered for, hey, this is probably spam. Because a lot of people will tag you. Also in the UK, that kind of stuff's illegal. Don't do that. Um, mm -hmm. make, make sure that they have voluntarily signed up to your list. Oh, they, they had voluntarily signed up. Okay. It was all, all right. voluntary. They just didn't, they, they're like, oh, that's so cool. I'm going to leave and stop talking. I'm signed. I'm, I'm leaving. That's all right. Because <laughs> their mic drop. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I missed a lot of that because my internet's having conniptions. I don't, I don't know what's happening. Well, at least it worked during your presentation. That was the perfect time for it to work. <laughs> but... Do we have anything else we would like to discuss today? I know that we've been here for almost two hours, so you guys are real troopers. And uh, yeah, I should probably get going. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, I know um, for all of you, it's a little bit later, or a lot later. So uh, yeah, yeah. If if anybody wants to talk monetization, I'm that's my favorite thing. So um, I'm, I'm at oh no, at <laughs> no oh, it's happening. Dot com. Feel free. <laughs> So one more time. The Zoom conspires against you, madam. <laughs> Liz at woodenovercoats.com if you awesome. want. Awesome, there it is. I already shot me. you an email. I'm very happy to talk to people. <laughs> now, shut up. Thank you. <laughs> Every time it's like, no, you don't get that gold enough. <laughs> 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 you can't. Well, um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, guys. Yeah, uh, before yeah. you all go, I'd, I'd love to hear, like, just who you are and um, what your show is before you sign off. So at least I know who 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 we've all been listening, who's all been listening, and who we've been talking to. 
Yeah, sorry. So when I make this into a video, I'm actually going to put a list of like who everybody is um, before the discussion starts, but I guess we can end with the introductions. Um, Case of point a note for next time. <laughs> yeah, I'll know for next time. Again, first one, so I'm learning. Um, I'm Caitlin Statz. Uh, I am one of the co-founders of Fool and Scholar Productions, LLC, and I write The White Vault and Liberty. Um, I think everybody is in a different order, so I'm going to go with Austin. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm Austin Beach. I was, I was the uh, co-founder of Audio Oblivious Productions and co-creator of Winnebago Warrior. Um, we have since retired that name, and we're going in a different direction, and we have rebranded ourselves. Okay. Um, down now known as Broken Bard Studios. Sorry. Oh, fine. Sorry. Uh, uh, Colton. Hi. Um, my name is Colton Flick. Um, in the past, I worked on a show called The Magical History of Knox County that released in uh, October of 2017. Um, and I'm now working on a new show called Still Lives uh, that's releasing um, on podcast platforms and tapable in uh, about a month, hopefully. Cool. Uh, Liz, we've heard from you a lot, but tell us again. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I'm Liz. I uh, am the production manager on Wooden Overcoats and the business manager on... Am I stuttering again? Nope, you're good. <laughs> you said okay. it. Victoriosity and wooden overcoats is what I do. Cool. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Next, we're going to go with Eric. Hi, um, I'm Eric. I'm one of the co creators of Marsfall and hopefully many more projects that you guys will see in the future. All right. Um, ha uh, Hem? Hi, I'm Hem known across the world as either Hem or Volonda. Uh, I am the DM and the producer for the Lucky Die podcast, which is an actual play podcast for D&D. All right, uh, Kennedy. Hi, my name is uh, Kennedy Phillips. I'm, the, I'm, a, I'm a Foley artist by trade, and I'm the creator, writer, director, and sound designer for Magus Elgar, which is an 11 episode uh, audio drama. Okay, and I think Kareem is asleep, but does anybody wanna say what Kareem does? Uh, Kareem is a voice actor on lots of different things. Uh, he We've worked is... with him on our show. Liberty. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's on What's the Frequency? He, um, he was Rogers. on... Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> lo everything. He's on everything. Okay. Yes, and uh, last is Travis. Oh, I'm sorry. I saved you for last. There you go, Travis. Oh, uh, I'm Travis. I'm the producer and sound designer for The White Vault Liberty um and other shows i'm also the uh dungeon master and writer behind dark dice an actual play podcast as well it's terrifying so that's who we all are um i think that's a good place to end it so everybody can either go to sleep or go eat dinner or do whatever the heck they want to do that isn't here on zoom <laughs> so thank you everybody for coming to the first audio drama roundtable event where we discuss project funding where to start and i hope that this was the first of many and uh, we're going to have Travis, who is our host, shut us down.